Hi again. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Andy Shepard. So it's really a pleasure to welcome Andy Shepard. Andy is a uh, is research director at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia. He's dealing with the health and biodiversity for the management of invasive species and diseases program. Andy is actually also uh, in charge of um, the Zero European Lab in Montpellier, and uh, he's a lot of research activities about weed and pest invasive management for, in Australia, South Africa, and France. So it's really a pleasure for me to welcome you, Andy, and uh, success. <laughs> Look, thank you, Sonia, and uh, thank you, Rebecca, and my, my hosts, and, and, uh, and allowing me to come out this close to Christmas and spend Christmas with my family in France. So, uh, really pleased to be here. So, I've, I've been set a big challenge, and I've only got 40 minutes to do it. I wrote a 300 page report on this subject, so to get through it all, the interesting bits in 40 minutes is going to be a challenge. So, I'm going to have to um, skirt over some of the technical details while I try and convince you that gene drives are safe but uh, we could always come back to them in the questions. So my, my, uh, my task was to talk to you about some, some of the novel technologies that are coming online for the prevention, surveillance, and control of invasive alien species, obviously very much from an Australian perspective. So I thought I'd start by just giving you a bit of an Australian perspective on invasive alien species. They've been around in Australia for a very long time. These are the mouse plagues of the early 1900s, even ending up in people's food. Then we had rabbit plagues that were in parallel. Huge problems for the Australian economy um, and agriculture. The, uh, the important release of, of foxes and cats, which have been the, huge, the, the greatest impact on Australian native mammals, which I'll come back to. The infamous cane toad that we deliberately introduced ourselves, though I hasten to say we did it when we didn't have any, before we had any formal risk assessment. So we just put that one down to being a mistake. And we have big infestations of invasive fish like carp. Obviously, we have mosquitoes along with most other tropical and subtropical countries, agricultural pests that also affect our agricultural economy. So what I'm trying to, to, to explain to you is that in, in the context of Australia, this concept you have in Europe of this new area of invasive alien species management is not new for us at all. All of our historical pests, weeds, and diseases were effectively invasive alien species. So we've been trying to manage invasive alien species in the context of the agricultural uh, and, and natural ecosystems for you know, over, over 100 years, uh, which means we've, we've been investing a lot of energy in, into the science and, and, and uh, always trying to adopt the latest technology. So uh, unlike many countries, it's actually invasive plants which cost, cause the highest economic impact to our agriculture, followed by uh, the other kinds of pests and diseases, um, and in terms of the impacts of, of uh, invasive alien species on our biodiversity, the one that the government is most focused on is our cats and foxes, uh, because the, uh, the um, impacts of cats and foxes have led to Australia having the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the um, un unhelpful statistic of being, having the highest level of vertebrate mammal, native mammal extinction in the world. Um, which, um, and also having a big impact on, on island bird biodiversity. And so um, uh, invasive alien species are now recognized in Australia as one of the key, the, really the top key threatening process to our threatened and endangered um, uh, species. So very important from a, a context of, uh, uh, of us trying to be able to manage the problem in a practical sense. Now, um, so I've already mentioned that for Australia, it's, uh, pest weeds and diseases have been a problem for us for over, over 100 years, and we've been coming up with novel ways of trying to management since then. The other real challenge for Australia is that I did this calculation over, um, this morning that for every taxpayer in Australia, we, we, a tax, the taxpayer has to cover two square, square kilometres of land, whereas in the EU, I estimated that every taxpayer's money only has to cover 100 square metres. So... Being able to do this manually, being able to do this using conventional uh, uh, um, backbreaking um, control methods is just completely impossible in Australia, which I believe forced Australia to think much more proactively about interventionist 
management approach is very early in its history and why it has a, a, strong, a strong history in trying to adopt new technologies. Um, we've also, as I said, we've also had some mistakes. We released uh, the cane toad to control grubs in sugarcane and it became a major environmental pest. But there have been changes recently. Australia has recently appointed its first chief environmental biosecurity officer under the, recently, uh, the recent act, the, Bio the Australian Biosecurity Act. And, uh, and very recently, in the last two weeks, we've just, the government has just merged our Department of Agriculture with our Department of Environment, which really allows us to focus our attentions of a lot of investment into agricultural pest management, also paying off as benefits to managing invasive alien species in the context of the environment. So what has Australia done that, um, that's really, um, I suppose, been its, its most interventionist focus? And this is, this is the classic, this is the, the rabbit biological control program. Rabbits have major in Australia domestic, sorry, European rabbits in Australia introduced in the early 1900s have had huge impacts on both agriculture and the environment. And very early on, we realized that we needed to be able to do something about them. And we were very fortunate to find a highly specific uh, disease of rabbits that we could use as a, a biological control agent, which after 30 years of, of research and risk assessment led to its introduction as myxomatosis in the 1950s, and I'm sure many of you are aware of it. And Australia has been in a battle, an ongoing battle with rabbits ever since. As the, the rabbits recover from and develop resistance to the disease, we've had to find other diseases to knock the rabbits down. But it's been an ongoing program of over 60 years, and from an agricultural perspective, it's generated over $70 billion of benefit. So highly cost-effective from a government investment point of view. And Australia is still the only country in the world that's ever carried out a, a vertebrate pest biological control program using a virus. And now we're con contemplating doing the same thing to control the invasive fish carp. So we, we're prepared to try and, 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 and take... And, and, and understand and develop high risk, potentially high risk systems to be able to manage our invasive alien species. Now, similarly, we have a very long history of biological control of weeds. Uh, this is the, the, you've probably all heard of the prickly pear story from the 1930s. Again, it was about 25 years of research before uh, prickly pear uh, cactoblasis biocontrol agent was released and became very effective. Um, and this is the other uh, really big success story, which I had quite a lot to do with myself the introduction of, of insect biocontrol agents to control a toxic pasture weed from, from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which has been a very successful progr program and developed a lot of uh, high levels of benefit for Australian agriculture. But we have, we've, been, we've also undertaken many biological control programs against environmental weeds, many of which have been, have been successful, and where they haven't been successful have generated very few, very minor off-target impacts. So again, highly beneficial for, for long-term management of highly uh, challenging invasive alien species. Anyway, that's history. I'm now moving on to what are the, what are the new, where are the new technology opportunities for us? And I was asked to address this in the context of prevention as well as, con as control. So I'm, I'm going through it in a, in a on a technology focus uh, to just provide you with some of the, 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 the ideas that are being pursued in Australia and the way they're being adopted. So. Um, uh, I'm start, going to start by talking about some of the, 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 the citizen crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing activities that have been done, which is building on some stuff we heard this morning around citizen science, and then talking about how uh, ICT technologies in the digital age are starting to influence the way we manage pests as well. So crowdsourcing. Um, obviously, we're, we're all taking a huge advantage of, um, of citizen science and the portals that are that we're developing in order to uh, use the eyes and ears of our citizens as surveillance and detection mechanisms. And that's really, really helpful in terms of understanding the impacts and changes of species distribution. But, but we've also in Australia been, been uh, trying to use um, social media and, and analyzing indirectly information that's transmitted in social media to also understand where new problems are emerging. Now, uh, Australia, or my organization, collects every single Twitter um, message produced in Australia and has developed uh, uh, algorithms to be able to analyze these based on keywords. The World, Health, the World Health Organization already uses this approach to try and understand when there are new outbreaks of, of human uh, infectious diseases. 
Uh, but it's a great opportunity to use data that's freely available and apply artificial intelligence to be able to scope out and under, identify new problems very early in the, in the piece to be able to, 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 to jump on them and improve our prevention. And, and there's increasing investment in Australia to try and use uh, these kinds of data sources to understand uh, movement and spread of invasive alien species. There's also the rise, obviously, of, um, uh, of, of uh, digital technology and, uh, uh, and robotics. And this is having a huge impact too. And in, in a country like Australia, where most of the country is remote, um, you, 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 we're really trying to take advantage of these sorts of approaches to understand uh, uh, the spread of weeds, uh, the movement and densities of vertebrate pests through, through thermal imagery, um, and, uh, and, and all of the opportunities this pre presents, while recognizing that there are also uh, regulatory channel challenges about using some of these technologies. Uh, and increasingly using satellite data. Um, most of Australia is, is, has no internet access. And we recognize, you know, it's recognized that, uh, and there's a strong government investment in, 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 in uh, 5G and low orbital satellites that can potentially bring 5G to the whole of Australia. And the opportunity that would bring for us to be able to uh, run uh, remote-based autonomous systems to try and, uh, and analyze and, and, uh, and monitor the spread of key invasive alien species, as well as digital agriculture and all the other opportunities that brings, is something the government's really trying to, to, uh, to, to, to um, uh, take advantage of. Um, increasingly, we're seeing robotics entering agriculture, but this, this robotics is also being used in Australia to uh, manage our environmental weeds. We have uh, uh, programs, so our state governments, which are responsible for managing in, uh, invasive alien species on the ground, are employing robotic, uh, robotics companies to do not only the surveillance to understand how they're spreading and moving across the landscape, but also going in and, and providing an autonomous mechanism of control, be it the distribution of uh, uh, or the injection of a herbicide. And so th this also in the context of, of, uh, of a remote country like Australia provides us with really much more cost-effective ways of being able to understand the problem and try and address it, partic particularly when uh, after major environmental uh, extreme events, we're in, a, we're in probably the biggest drought in Australia in living memory, uh, these challenges are on, only, only come to the fore uh, as more important problems after the drought breaks. Increasing use of sensor networks too. This is basically remotely connected uh, uh, transmitters that you can attach to animals or you can set up as networks across the landscape that communicate amongst themselves and you only have to have one sensor within the, within the mobile phone network for all the data to be uploaded and it allows you to uh, um, be able to uh, understand the health of your ecosystems, understand the movement of, uh, of undesirable invasive alien species through those ecosystems and, and how to more effectively manage, manage them. We've got a, a project at the, at the moment trying to use this to help manage our feral and understand our feral pig populations in the context that you know, African swine fever is, is not far away from Australia and could very soon uh, enter, enter our feral pig populations. And there are similar applications in the context of agriculture, these sensor networks. Great opportunity in terms of how to remotely manage uh, uh, and, and understand the threats of invasive alien species. Also, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, detection technologies for your surveillance, the, um, the, um, the smart trapping surveillance systems. Traditionally, uh, pests are monitored through trapping grids that are manually visited and, and, and analyzed uh, every few days. Well, there's a, there's a, there are an increasing number of autonomous systems that are coming onto the market. Here's one for fruit flies that's been developed in Australia where the traps are completely autom um, automated uh, and uh, the, the data allows uh, the trapping system to be re rearranged in the landscape to optimize the level of monitoring. And the data that's collected from those traps actually becomes uh, uh, an e uh, valuable economically in terms of small businesses and SMEs to be able to be set up. To, to undertake these kinds of activities. And this kind of technology will become increasingly available for, for uh, invasive alien species op uh, opportunities as well. So they're, um, they're, they're largely autonomous, they're technology based, they're real time, and the, the, da the data and, and, and analysis provides 
really, really good intelligence of how species are spreading across the landscape. Another bit of, uh, of hardware that's been developed by CSIRO is called CyberNose. And CyberNose can be used at the borders. It's a bit like your electronic uh, 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 border uh, detection dog. Uh, but it can, um, I think border detection, those dogs at the borders can, can, can measure up to about 20 uh, different uh, smells. Uh, the, the, this, this technology is, is much more sensitive than that and go, it can go into the hundreds, if not thousands, uh, uh, and can be designed. And basically, it's a bit of high tech that uh, signals the moment uh, a, a, nasty, uh, a particular odor, or in some, some cases, um, molecule in a liquid is picked up to be able to much more rapidly at the border in real time detect whether you've got a, a, risk, uh, a risky uh, organism coming in, particularly for all those volatile biomarkers that uh, many of our pests uh, and weeds emit. And it's built on, an, on a natural system. It's built on um, uh, 300 nematode olfactory receptors, which are, are, each one has been uh, analyzed to work out exa exactly which kind of odor it can detect. So that's uh, a sort of brief run through of where the, 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 the um, digital technology space is, is evolving. Um, I want to spend the rest of my time uh, um, talking a little about, about gene technologies because that's the other area where there's been such enormous growth around opportunities. Um, and uh, with, the, with the, the declining availability of pesticides, we'll have to return to biological-based control me measures. And in the context, as I say, of very extensive uh, systems like Australia, uh, gene technologies uh, really pro pose uh, a potential really exciting opportunity that as a national science agency, it is our responsibility to, to really try and understand. So I'm just going to briefly cover, cover three kinds of gene technology. The, the RNA, RNA, RNA interference technology, which is like a specific biopesticide where you effectively create a small sequence of RNA to knock out um, a vital gene in your target organisms to, 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 run the, to, to render it uh, un, um, uh, unharmful. I'm also going to talk about self-limiting genetic solutions, which is based on kind of classic Mendelian inheritance, where you flood the population with uh, um, deleterious genotypes in the, in the context of tri trying to suppress those populations further. But I'll also briefly cover off on, on, on these kind of uh, gene drive systems, which are in many cases, in, in, in many parts of the world, in many agencies, uh, presenting huge red lights of, of, of high risk and concern. But like all new technologies, it may take us 20 or 30 years to understand how to use them effectively and, and, and with an acceptable level of risk to the general public. But unless we start understanding them, we'll never get there. So RNA, RNAi was a, um, a technology approach developed primary, first in in the context of animal health and then was developed in, in, in the context of plant health and creates a, a, a specific genetic-based bio, biocide uh, that can target specific target genes in your target organism. And it, it, it works by disrupting that translation uh, of DNA into protein in cells. But it re requires, like all biopesticides, it requires a del delivery mechanism to get it into the target cells to be effective. And that's always been the big challenge. It's a big challenge with many of the biopesticides, and it's a big challenge with RNAi. And it generally comes in two types, either endogenous, where it's actually um, encrypted into the plant, the, your, your, your crops, or your, the plants you want to save, and expressed as part of the, uh, the living organism. Or it can be applied ex, ex, exogenously, like a chemical. And that's where it has a potential value for tackling some of uh, of, of our invasive alien species, and increasingly it seems to be pathogens may be the first uh, cab off the rank here. So RNAi interference has been used very broadly in agriculture to improve all sorts of plant traits. So as a mechanism and demonstrating the impact it can have, it's already got a proven record. It's, it simply uh, persists in the environment as long as any uh, piece of, of uh, exotic uh, uh, RNA can persist, so it doesn't hang around very long. It's, it uh, hasn't got the, the long-term risks of, of some of these more recent technologies, but it still presents uh, quite a lot of challenges around delivery into the target cells and also the costs of its use compared to 
other conventional mechanisms like herbicides. But we've, we're starting to see now at least that RNAi is starting to work for managing some, some plant uh, viral and fungal diseases. And as we, as we start to see that uh, an increasing number of the invasive alien species that are circulating around the, 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 our native ecosystems are plant pathogens, this may present a new, new mechanism for us to be able to target and suppress some of those, uh, those uh, particular targets. It's even been proposed as a mechanism for managing a weed, and this is a, a, a patent held by the, the, the US um, Geological Survey to uh, potentially use RNA viruses, sorry, RNA uh, interference to control Phragmites in the US. Hasn't been practically demonstrated yet, but people are thinking about its use into various kinds of organisms. Now, moving on to uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the genetic technology opportunities around inheritance. So as I said earlier, there are two ways in which you can apply a genetic technology to try and control a target organism that you want to suppress the population density of. One is, is using classic Mendelian genetics, uh, where your, your gene of interest is introduced into the population and sped through the population in classic uh, Mendelian inheritance mechanisms. And these are what we call self-limiting gene genetic constructs to reduce population fitness using Mendelian inheritance. And there are, there are many of these who, that are, uh, uh, have, been, have been explored and are being used in agriculture. Uh, the, uh, there, there are, um, and, and, in, and in managing vectors of diseases, there are uh, these self-limiting ge genetic constructs now that are used in the context of, of fruit fly and mosquito management. There's the, um, uh, the use of um, uh, increasing use of sterile insect techniques and, and the application of Gene, gene, genetic approaches to SIT to make SIT more efficient and also broaden the, the, the range of target organisms you can use it against. Um, and we've even, we, we, we had a program running for 15 years in Australia to see whether we could use this kind of technology to manage our, our, our number one uh, pest fish, uh, European carp, in which we went through a process of dry, trying to see if we could develop a, a, ster, uh, a, a dautilus, a, a um, a female sterile genotype of carp that we could then release into uh, the Australian uh, aquatic ecosystems to suppress carp populations. And we, we, um, we demonstrated the proof of concept in a, in a small invasive fish, Gambusia, which is a subtropical uh, species in our northern river systems, and, and, and got to the point of generating our F1 carriers of the, the Daudalus carp uh, construct in, in carp. However, at this point, there needed to be a huge investment in being able to being prepared to rear up these carp in vast numbers to be able to release them. And also, we hadn't uh, uh, really, in, the, in this project, addressed the, ch the challenge of public acceptability. Would this technology be acceptable to the public? So unfortunately, funding dried up, and it wasn't taken any further. But at least we developed this kind of technology to a proof of concept in one of our key invasive alien species. And if we were going to re-adopt this approach now with the current, the, the more recent genetic approaches that have be become available, things like CRISPR, we could do, much more, do it much more efficiently now than we did back then. So it's still a potential op op opportunity for us. We've also got uh, uh, um, a research team working around, led by uh, Marcik Maselko, who's looking at uh, synthetic speciation. Can you actually create artificial species of the target the, through, through, through uh, uh, synthetic uh, biology uh, of the target you're dealing with so that when they cross back together, they create, create either, either lethal or, or, um, or, or single sex um, offspring. Again, it's, it's, in, it's in the conceptual phase, but it's another opportunity for, um, uh, for, for using uh, this kind of Mendelian approach to be able to try and manage uh, pest species. It's, it's being trialed in, in, in uh, Drosophila, but could equally be, be applied in, in some other agricultural pests. But again, it may even be, have a potential opportunity in, in invasive species like carp. And then moving on to, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Am I doing all right? Good, I'm char char charging along faster than I thought. That's good. And then, so the meiotic, meiotic gene drives. Here you're um, creating a genetic construct which um, is uh, biased 
in the way it's inherited in the offspring. And so um, the gene, and I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, of, of the, the concept of a gene drive. Basically, you have a capacity to spread your deleterious gene into all of your offspring and then all of their offspring, and so have the potential, in this case, to, um, to drive your pest population male as a, as a mechanism to try and control it. And you can do that through two approaches. You can do, do it using a, a naturally biased genetic inheritance system that occur in most animals, or you can do it synthetically using CRISPR-Cas9. And it's the CRISPR-Cas9 gene drives that, of course, so, or the potential that, 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 and, uh, that they've, uh, and the discussion around that has caused so much controversy. So this is a self-sustaining meiotic dream gene drive system and a, a genetic mechanism, be it through a natural gene drive system or a synthetic one that can propagate modified genes through a tar target population via supermendelian inheritance with the aim of being able to control those populations. As I said, there are a number of these natural selfish gene elements that exist out there. So they're kind of you like natural gene drives and you can harness them as a mechanism for carrying your gene construct into the population. And I list here a, a number of them that are already occur in, in, in all, most organism types, be they insects, vertebrates, or plants. Um, and we've had a particular focus on the last one here, the, the t sri gene in mice is a mechanism for uh, driving a gene drive into rodent populations, which I'll come back to. So you can use natural systems, but you can also use the synthetic ones. And then along came, came CRISPR um, uh, a few years ago, which allowed us to develop a, a synthetic basis for producing these gene drives. And that's where, you know, the, we heard in the pr pr press about our capacity. Maybe we now have a tool that can allow us to, you know, eradicate pests, widespread pests that we were never ever, we've never been able to do up to now, and that generated the excitement, and I think really has, um, has led to the, the, the next golden age of research into um, how we can manage our invasive alien species. So the idea of a synthetic gene drive system was first raised in 2002. 2009 provided the tools to do it, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 gene shears. By uh, uh, 2014, G G gene drives were a GM reality. They'd been started developing mosquitoes as part of the target mos malaria mosquito control program. And then people started to realize, oh shit, this is high risky stuff. We need to really start to address public concerns and, 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 and public perceptions of risk around this technology. And really since 2016, most of the investment in this space in the US and uh, Australia has been around understanding what the public acceptability issues are, uh, trying to address and be open about the ethics questions and, and, and working closely with regulators as, as to how this technology should and must be regulated into the future. So a lot of the research hasn't been actually on developing gene drives. It's been doing all of the, the other stuff you need to do in order to be able to have a legitimate case for even contemplating use, using one of these systems in the future. The, uh, uh, um, Kevin Esfeldt from MIT in the US was the first one to really identify the opportunities. This is uh, where gene drives could be used as a pest animal population control tool, but he was also one of the, almost immediately afterwards stood up and said, this is high risk technology and we need to be very careful about how we do it. He identified that, uh, that it has uh, applications in the environment, in human health and in agriculture, but it also has uh, a real opportunity in sustainable pest management. And he recognized that there are various ways in which you can, you can use a gene drive to suppress populations, be it biasing the sex ratio, inducing a toxin, increasing susceptibility to disease, or shortening lifespan. So then comes in CRISPR, and I've got a few couple of slides here on the, on the, on the, 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 uh, the detailed technology of how CRISPR works, which I won't have time to go into, but basically a mechanism out of bacteria that's been able to uh, copy uh, genes, uh, your deleterious gene onto any chromosome that has the right target sequence. This is the mechanism how it works. The cassette is basically made out of the guide RNA, which tells you where the CRISPR cassette needs to, to stick to the chromosome. The, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9, which does the cutting in the payload, which is your deleterious gene you want to put into the system. Um, and uh, the gene drive in the, under this mechanism leads to various modes of action. Either it works and you get the kind of classic uh, uh, optimized gene drive system that anybody, anybody or that, that all um, uh, synthetic biologists in this space would like to see, or it doesn't, and you get a, uh, a mutation at, the, at the, the target site, and then you've created a resistant allele. 
and a, and a, and a resistant genotype in the, in the population. And this is, I think, has really come to the fore in terms of understanding the likelihood that a classic gene drive in this system might ever work is that in all the modeling that's been done, the resistance alleles replicate so fast that a classic gene drive system, uh, as we currently imagine it, couldn't, could never work. Resistance would build up in the population too quickly. But anyway, as, a, as, a, as an approach, there are, the, the science is still going on. There'll be new, new ways of approaching the system. There are an increasing focus on how we can uh, de-risk a gene drive system as well. But it does have a lot of advantages from, in the context of the discussion we had before lunch. It's monospecific as a control technique. It provides you with potential a mechanism to control species at a landscape scale. The control is disseminated within the target itself, so that it's contained within the genotype uh, of, the, of the target organism, and it generates no environmental residues the way that all of our pesticides do. And it's also uh, much more humane than existing uh, culling, baiting, and toxin techniques that we already use for our vertebrate pests. Uh, so, for example, our discussions with uh, the RSPCA around the potential use of this technology have actually been quite constructive. <laughs> but it has various requirements. It, it needs, you need to identify the genes you're going to disrupt. You need uh, a mutation pathway. You need to find a mechanism to get those, that, uh, that, those mutations into, onto the, 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 into the uh, chromosomes at the right point. It needs to be a sexually reproducing organism. Ideally, it needs to have a short life cycle. And, and, and also, your deleterious gene shouldn't uh, uh, affect the long-term fitness of your organism. Otherwise, again, it'll disappear. All of these are really challenging to achieve. Um, so you need gene flow. You need, um, you need to be able to potentially do releases at large spatial scales to get quick and fast control. You need, um, this, uh, you need a, a payload gene transfer system that's efficient, that, that works in more cases than it doesn't. And you need uh, to get around any potential for, for resistance evolution, and that's been, been one of the real challenges. But it does provide uh, a mechanism for delivering a whole wa wave of potential control uh, uh, mechanisms to try and suppress your target populations. And here I list some of them. So we've talk already talked about um, changing the sex ratio, but you can, you can increase the population susceptibility to some benign chemicals, so you spread that gene construct through the population, and then once it's in the whole population, you could use some benign chemical, to, uh, like ammonia or something, to, to control your target pest. So many, many opportunities, it's probably as many as you let your imagination run. But then I'll, just to finish off, I just wanted to cover off on some of the global concerns and how we're thinking about these in Australia in the context of pursuing and exploring this technology. We're not advocates, we're simply trying to explore it for its, for its future potential. So you've got the two Two, two, two sides of the argument. You've got the excitement, comes from what we could do, and you've got the panic from, from uh, all of the concerns that have been raised around these kinds of technology. And you need to understand these, recognize these, and, and work through them in terms of, of getting some uh, level of understanding in the community and in governments around uh, how and when these technologies, if ever, might have an opportunity to be used. So the risks that have been raised is they're uncontrollable. Once released, they can't be recalled. You know, synthetic gene drive carriers are GMO, so, so they need to be highly regulated. Will we ever get permission to release a GMO into a natural ecosystem to manage that natural ecosystem? There's the spread that the target uh, uh, may spread into native, your gene construct may spread into native populations and lead to extinction risk in the native range. That's the most, one that's most uh, commonly raised. So we need to be, be able to de-risk this technology if we're ever going to be able to use it. We need to have very tough and rigorous regulations around its use. But trying to suggest that we do a moratorium on this kind of research is, I think, not helpful. And there have been a number of, uh, number of papers published in high-impact journals that have looked at uh, uh, the risks associated with this technology and how, how to safeguard from it. And I just show a number of them here. So it's been, been high news. Um, but uh, the NGOs, the biggest demander of this are actually the environmental NGOs that want to find more cost-effective ways of, of managing invasive alien species. Um, and they've been mobile, and, but there are also an equal group of NGOs that are completely counter to it. So it's really a fight at the moment going on between NG, different NGOs in the NGO space. And it's, it's happening through uh, the meetings of the IUCN, 
Uh, we've got the World Conservation Congress in Marseille next year, which will see another big discussion about this. And the CBD has also uh, had having deep discussions too about this technology. So it's exciting stuff from a science perspective. And this is an IUCN report that was commissioned on assessing um, the genetic for frontiers for conservation in synthetic biology, which also goes into great depth around gene drives. So as a, as a research community, we've sit down and said, well, we need basic principles around the research that we undertake to make sure that, that, it's, that, um, there are, that, that it's transparent, that people understand what we're trying to do. We're very open about the risks and we're very clear to, to, in the context of what we're actually trying to do and what we're trying to do when. And that, that too has now been published in, uh, in science to demonstrate uh, a, 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 an ethical uh, position in the research community around the, the, the exploration of the technology. There have been a couple of uh, reports published in, uh, in, by, in, by national uh, science academies also <coughs> looking at this kind of technology and how risky it is. So there's a lot of background information. I won't go into this level of detail, but they've all looked at these issues of ethics, risk, risk assessment, regulation, public consultation, and a lot of the energy has been put into that space. So do we not proceed with this kind of technology given the potential it has? Or do we proceed with caution? And we would argue in Australia based on, on uh, our need to be able to consider these new technological approaches that you should proceed but with caution. You focus on the science, you focus on the risk assessment, and you focus equally on the science, uh, the, so the social licensing uh, uh, requirements for developing this kind of technology and do it in an open uh, framework uh, uh, process. And a lot of research has come out recently into the so what are the social concerns about this technology, and are they unsurmountable? Are the, wh where, where do we need to address the risks in being able to develop a technology that's safe? So do they work? That's the other big challenge. Well, the, the target malaria certainly thinks so, and they've got a, a, a genetically modified um, uh, gene drive system in mosquitoes, but they're not planning to release that anytime soon either. They're going through a huge public engagement process. The second target system where we've been doing most of our work is in the context of, of rodents on islands and trying to come up with a gene drive product that could work potentially in rodents. And this is done as part of a consortium of uh, um, uh, seven research agencies across New Zealand, Australia, and the United States, um, which are listed across the middle. And all of the research elements that, need to, that are being undertaken by that consortium are the rectangular boxes. Uh, and as you can see, very few of those are actually developing a gene drive system. Most of it's to do with understanding the risks and working out what might be a practical way forward. And it's called G-Bird, for those who are interested. And this is, I'm just, I'm not going to go into technical detail, but a lot of the emphasis now is on how do you de-risk it. And here's a couple of, of, of research activities that are ongoing as to how you might de-risk a, um, a gene drive type system. And this is using a sex distortion, uh, distortion gene drive that would only operate on, uh, on the sex chromosomes. There is the unique allele approach. If you can find a unique allele in your invasive population that doesn't occur in the native range, you can target your gene drive through that unique allele, and therefore it could not be translated into your native populations. And Kevin Esfeld himself has, has got a YouTube video showing how uh, he's a daisy chain system that he's come up with that, that could potentially decouple the, the inner workings of a gene drive system to, me, to make it only effective for a number of generations. And base editors is a way of counting uh, generations, so you could limit the number of generations over which a gene drive system could operate. So there's a lot of thinking going into how do we de-risk risk it. And there are potential, lots of potential future targets. We actually went on a big publicity campaign in, the, in Australia. Would, would Australians worry if we came up with a, gene, a genetically modified cane toad that could potentially wipe out cane toads? Nobody seemed to object to that. They all hate cane toads so much. But it seemed to be that we, had, we already had broad public acceptance, which was a bit of a worry. Um, the National Carp Control uh, Plan. A lot of, many of you are aware we're in the process of, of exploring the feasibility of releasing a highly specific virus to control carp. We know that virus, like in the rabbits, will, 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 will fail in the long term. But while the carp populations are low through the initial uh, release, could we in, incorporate a genetic-based approach to actually suppress them? to the point where uh, they would be suppressed for the long term. Weeds, could we use it in weeds? Another really challenging area I haven't got time to go into, but we've written a couple of papers uh, to try and explore the opportunities in weeds. And cats is the, is the real one the NGOs would like us to get into. We, we keep telling them we've got to have something that works and is pu publicly acceptable in mice before we could go to cats. But they're already ahead of us in the context of, 
wanting to reduce the impacts of cats on, 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 on native fauna. And we've come up with a whole research structure as to how we might actually deal with a, a program on cats. So, I suppose my message to you is, is and this is, a, this is broader than this just message, but there are new technologies out there and it may take us 20, 30, as it did in the past, or more years to decide, yes, they could be effective and safe, or no, they couldn't. But because the, the, of the, the potential they present, it, I, I think, it, I believe, as a, as, a, as a science program leader in the National Science Agency, it behoves us to actually understand them, work on them, and see if they really do have, have potential to, to, to dramatically change our capacity to be able to manage invasive alien species. The, at, the, at the end of the day, it won't be us that decides whether or not they're used. It'll be the public and the regulatory and government processes that surround them. But that's no reason, I think, to turn our back on them and walk away. And I'd just like to thank all of the scientists that helped me put this talk together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for this uh, really refreshing and very enthusiastic uh, outlook into novel technologies. At least most of them were very novel to me. Um, we are probably, it was a very clear take home message. We were probably in Europe, uh, we are still at the point where we are starting to think about biocontrol, let alone gene drive. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping this will have triggered uh, at least some people from the audience uh, to think about it more. So we're happy to take some questions for you. Yeah, my, my colleagues thought that I was mad presenting this to an EU audience, so <laughs> please push back. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I'm not a geneticist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Neither am I, by the way. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> a bit worrying. Um, <laughs> so with these um, ones where they become, effectively, they produce infertile offspring, um, do they just eventually run out of, of fertile wild contemporaries to produce with? Is that the idea? So the idea is you, you basically make them either male or female sterile. Okay. So they're infertile in the context of being able to produce both sexes, mm -hmm. and then by driving the sex, the, the sex ratio increasingly male or increasingly female, then, then eventually the population will crash. Gotcha. And if you're doing that in the context of, a, of a, an invasive rodent on an island of high biodiversity value, mm. you know, that's contained and, and manageable. And if it works, it will drive itself to extinction. And just out of curiosity, it's a bit of a jump from, away from invasive species, but if you look at something like sea turtles with sex temperature determination, could you use something like a gene drive like that? Because um, they're suffering from skewed sex ratios because of climate change, for example. You mean use them for the benefits of the benefit mm -hmm. of? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of synthetic biology thinking mm. going into how you can use it to um, build uh, better resilience back into threatened species and threatened communities. There's projects going on looking at can we make coral reefs more resilient to temperature change, for example, mm -hmm. using synthetic biology. So yeah, it has all of those opportunities but as well. But you couldn't then just release it and let it kind of do its own job. You'd have to do it targeted, I guess, because otherwise it would just it's, be... It's really too early to say. Every system needs to be explored in its own right, mm. and you need to come up with... Um, uh, understand how the mechanism will work in the context of the, the ecology and the biology of the target organism, mm -hmm. and then, as I say, go through a whole process of whether, whether or not uh, doing something like that would be publicly acceptable. Okay. It's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, hello, it's Hazel Selly from Natural England um, in England. Um, I was just wondering. Sorry, I can't see you. Or you just um, wave. Here. Oh, right up there. Okay, hello. Yep, all the way up here. <laughs> um, I was just wondering because of um, previous kind of attempts to do similar things, like um, creating triploids for Pacific oysters, for example, or I think recently there was a genetic attempt to um, manipulate um, reproduction in the mosquitoes, mm. which didn't work out. Um, how would you kind of counter those, and also things like BSC and sort of science interfering with food production, how would you kind of counter those sort of negative trials um, to kind of get it accepted? Well, again, I think you, before we can really start to ask those questions, we have to have a viable product. We have to have an, an organism, with, you know, a, a target animal that we actually think can, can achieve what we want it to, and we haven't achieved that yet. 
Yeah, no, I do there is it's no, a fantastic idea. But once you've, once you've got something, and in fact, our, our biggest challenge in terms of getting investment is, is having a product. Until you have an animal that's got the construct and can potentially do what you want it to do, nobody wants to give you any money. But once you've got something like that, we've actually got a, lo a lot of feedback that people would be very keen to invest to then take it to the next stage, which is to start to do all the risk assessment under containment. Uh, it's we have one more. Okay. Have one question. Uh, um, I remember in the past uh, there have been the, um, some uh, genetic experiment about mosquitoes. If you, uh, if I remember uh, well, thirty years ago. Uh, Mutations uh, were used to sterilize mosquitoes, but uh, <laughs> when uh, uh, the population is manipulated and uh, we go in the environment, I mean, there is uh, uh, the interaction uh, genotype by environment. Yep. I remember that at, th at that time, I mean, the new technology uh, will be uh, more promising, but when uh, uh, mutations uh, 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 have been used, the, uh, the system didn't work, and mosquitoes still yep. <laughs> are a problem yeah. in the tropics. Yeah. yeah, well, and maybe it won't work. So, I mean, the uh, problem of uh, the interaction, genotype yep. by yep. environment, uh, yeah. has been uh, um, uh, assessed. Yeah, look, and, and I agree, most, most of these programs where, they've, where you've tried to use a genetic approach to manage an invasive alien species up to now have not worked. But if we could come up with a system that did work, the, the benefits are enormous. You know, so we invested in Australia, we invested in, in 20 years of research into uh, um, immunocontraception in, 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 in vertebrates, trying to come up with of, of genetically modified virus, vi vi modifying viruses so that they rendered their host uh, infertile. Didn't work because the viruses that we modified couldn't compete with wild type viruses. But we know we, the more we do this, the more we understand the issues. And the more we understand the issues, the more we can try and address them. And as, these, and as I say, we'll see a continual arrival of new approaches. The idea of gene drives is almost old hat now, that those opportunities may create a scenario in which something might work. And if it does, it gives us a tool that will, will, could be a game changer for us. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. This uh, wouldn't be an event on uh, exchanging management experience if we wouldn't build on the incredible wealth of expertise of managers and uh, hands-on projects in the fields. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, chair this afternoon session with uh, at least six talks uh, of various live projects across Europe. So we have projects from the Mediterranean, but also Central Europe and Northwest Europe, of course, uh, across a range of taxonomic uh, yeah, topics, let's say. And I uh, just quickly wanted to apologize also, because I know some of those people are in the room, to the number of projects we had to refuse on the program. There was a lot of interest uh, of all of you to come and speak here. And I want to just uh, quickly name them. So um, there's the Raccoon Dog project um, from Sweden, Myrdinek. There's Life Project 3 and Bullfrog which is actually trying to, it, it just kicked off and is trying to test uh, sterile male release for bullfrog control in Flanders. And there is a French uh, live Croa project, which is trying to manage uh, invasive amphibians like Xenopus and, uh, and American bullfrog as well. Um, I also hate to bring it to you, but uh, there will be no coffee break this afternoon. Um, but uh, it's because we want to invite you afterwards for a networking drink. So I don't want to rush my speakers neither, but uh, if you can be ahead of time all this time, you win during your shorter speech, you can spend longer over beer. Um, so what better way actually to start uh, with our co-organizers um, in the Rapid Life project. So I'm gonna hand over to Alexia and Corin Pratt from CABI to present a project.
Sorry, hiding behind you. Sorry. Hi there again. Um, doing a presentation on something I actually know a bit about this time. Um, so I'm here with Corinne. Uh, so Cabby is one of our um, collaborators in the Rapid Life project, and they're involved in the biocontrol work that we're doing. So Corinne's going to cover the technical side of that because I don't want to get anything wrong. Um, so I'm just going to sort of talk a little bit about the Rapid Life project and what it involves. So uh, everyone loves an acronym. So it's Reducing and Preventing IAS Dispersal. Um, the main gist of it is looking at um, the management of IES in aquatic environments. It's a three-year EU life project. Um, it started in 2017 and it's finishing uh, in July 2020. And uh, it's uh, led by the Animal and Plant Health Agency, which is where I work, and also um, with project partners Natural England, which is another UK government agency, and uh, the British Zoological Society. Um, and that's, uh, that's the amount of money, which looks like a lot, but actually over three years... Um, <laughs> Slightly limiting. Um, so yeah, the project's finishing in um, about six months' time. So um, there's a lot of very kind of wordy aims, but the main idea is to protect um, aquatic biodiversity and to try and make our approach to that to invasive species in those areas kind of more coordinated, more strategic, and more evidence-based in England. I forgot to mention the project only covers England, not the whole of the UK and also demonstrating the efficacy of, any, of these approaches um, to our European counterparts, which is what we're doing today. Um, so there's a few different objectives. Uh, so one of the main ones is to establish a regionally-based framework to deliver more effective management. And we did this by creating regional IAS management plans, which we call RIMPs, um, also to prevent the introduction of new IAS, so doing much of, lots of uh, biosecurity awareness raising. Um, to increase the awareness of kind of rapid response systems and early warning systems, and also to do some um, good practice approaches of actual eradication and control of IES in high priority areas. And then again, to uh, share this information with our European um, and other international uh, counterparts. So in, uh, for any of you maybe who don't know a lot about life programs, as far as I'm aware, I think it's the same for all life programs. They kind of have three phases normally. So the kind of preparatory phase, uh, the delivery phase, and what you call the afterlife phase. So the preparatory phase has been completed. That's where you do a lot of the kind of background research in the work. So in the case of rapid life, that included um, supporting the revision of biosecurity materials. So you, you would have heard earlier about the Check, Clean, Dry campaign. You would have seen the materials outside. That's been going on for a very long time with lots of other collaborators. We just helped to fund an update of it. Um, we also created an IES management toolkit, which is on our website with lots of useful resources for people to download. And that ranges from guidance on how to write a biosecurity plan for your site to um, good practice um, ways to manage Himalayan balsam. And we've got various species and things on there. And then also producing these management plans, which I mentioned. And this is linked in with the supporting software, which we supported for um, uh, kind of uploading records of IES. So um, in terms of these revised biosecurity materials for the Check, Clean, Dry campaign, previous research by other projects, um, particularly the, through the GBNNSS, uh, shows that it tends to be more effective if it's targeted towards user groups. So um, not only have we revised and updated the, the old uh, materials, but we've also helped to make them more focused for boaters, canal users, canoe users, anglers, and we've also got these um, border biosecurity campaigns as well, so just making it more targeted, really. And that was done through focus groups. Um, I think I mentioned we've got various things in these, um, so in, well, various resources in this IES management toolkit, which we created. And that's a kind of section of PowerPoint presentations and documents that you can download, um, and generally just uh, lots of materials, like some of the stuff's outside. But mainly to help people use those tools to actually practice better biosecurity themselves. Because a lot of the information was kind of out there, but it often wasn't collated in one place. So we were trying to put a lot of it into one place. So these RIMPs, the Regional IES Management Plans, what are they and what's the point? Um, so they're kind of the integral part of the Rapid Life project, really. And they kind of help to fulfill the aims of, of Rapid Life, which is taking all the high-level kind of legislation and then the guys on the ground who are actually doing a lot of the, the sort of heavy work and bringing them together and also helping it to be more strategic for the stakeholders, because a lot of people, at least in the UK, and I suspect in a lot of other member states, are doing a lot of really good work, but they're kind of scattered and they don't really talk to each other, so it's not very coordinated, which is a shame, because then it's not as effective. Um, so for the purposes of this project, we we're covering the whole of England, which is that colored in bit on the map, and we split it into five regions. 
So we have five RIMPs, um, so these management plans, so one for each of these regions. It is still quite a big area. In some ways, it would have been nicer to have it smaller. But the idea with them is, is that you have five consistent plans that kind of link up to cover the whole country. And people can, instead of just looking at a massive you know, document that covers the whole country, can get stuff that's more regionally specific or even locally specific that's more relevant to them so they can actually use it for their management. Um, and again, the main purpose of this is just to try and help things be more, more coordinated and more strategic. So back to these three phases. So the delivery phase is actually ongoing now. Um, so we have practical IS management projects. So that's, um, we've got things at a catchment scale, controlling uh, Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed. And so at a sub-catchment scale, we've got some work going on on some other species, such as American skunk cabbage, uh, giant hogweed, and floating pennywort. Sorry, I should say the Latin names, really. I can't remember them. Um, and we've also got some work going on with biocontrol, which I'm going to let um, Corinne cover, but that's mostly about Himalayan balsam and Japanese knotweed. Well, actually, it's just that. And we're also doing some work with crayfish management, which is really interesting, which I'll cover a bit later. I'm going to let uh, Corin take it from here. OK, I'll very, very quickly uh, cover the weed biocontrol aspect. So this is looking specifically at classical weed biological control. So that's obtaining natural enemies, natural enemies from the native range of the weed uh, to introduce to the introduced range after lots of safety testing and then release to provide ongoing control of the invasive plant. Um, so at CABI in the UK, we're looking at a variety of different projects. Uh, some of these are focused on uh, Great Britain with a European interest, I'm sure. So there's a couple of agents we're looking at for Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, uh, Crassula helmsii, Hydrocotyle, Azola folliculoides, and also Ludwigia species. Of these and selected for the rapid life study were two that we have licenses to release the agents for. Uh, so that's the Cilid Aphalara itadori against Japanese knotweed and the rust fungus Buccinia comorovii var glandulifera against um, Himalayan balsam. So I'm sure you all know Japanese knotweed, so first we'll touch on that. These are just some of the sites where we've conducted releases and different methods we've used for releases to try and aid establishment. Um, and this is the agent, it's Aphalara itadori. It's a psyllid, it sucks the sap of the plant. Um, so the Japanese knotweed biocontrol program has been going on um, for a number of years. So we had to align the sort of regulator and sponsor aims with the rapid life targets. Once it was agreed that there was good alignment and we could share data between the studies, it allowed us to work through Rapid Life with regional coordinators across the five English regions, uh, and they aided us with site selection and securing uh, and conducted releases and monitoring of the biocontrol agents. For knotweed, we aimed for three or four sites uh, in each of the five regions across England, and we aimed for riparian sites, um, as this is thought to be better for establishment of the psyllid uh, due to the high humidity. We retained some already established sites that we had prior to the onset of Rapid Life, uh, and in total, through Rapid Life, secured 14 sites in England. Unfortunately, in the east, well, fortunately in the east, they had good management in place for Japanese knotweed, so there were no suitable riparian habitats. So in this area, we focused on Himalayan balsam biocontrol. Um, so the Rapid Life psyllid releases took place in 2018, and since then, it's been monitoring, which will conclude in spring 2020. Um, and as mentioned, the releases and monitoring were conducted by the regional coordinators supported by CABI. Um, we aimed for three releases, early summer, late summer, and then an autumn release to try and aid overwintering success. And within the window of rapid life, which is just three years, we were really aiming for establishment of the agents um, with impact a longer term target. Uh, with the various challenges and opportunities, so there were some delays at the start, which meant it was hard to secure sites, which meant it was quite touch and go about early releases when we were trying to secure sites. We also lost some sites that had been secured, which is just a logistical challenge. Um, but more than anything, we had limited establishment of the agent. So the psyllid had limited establishment across the season in 2018, and then ov only overwintered successfully at a handful of sites in the Southwest, Midlands, and later we realized also in the Southeast. So there are probably a number of contributing factors to this, but from our assessment, it seems most likely due to a climatic mismatch between the psyllid, which was collected from southern Japan uh, and the UK environment. Um, so as mentioned, Rapid Life really is a snapshot of the biocontrol program. So within this, we're aiming for establishment and development of the methods of biocontrol release with control a longer term aim. Um, but it's allowed us also within England to develop this biocontrol stakeholder network with lots of people trained in and understanding biocontrol and taking part in actual releases and monitoring. They've assisted with sites, releases and monitoring. Uh, and also having these sites through Rapid Life has allowed a 
a, a large geographic range and lots of variability in the habitats where we were able to release, which is beneficial for uh, assessing establishment. It's also allowed us to develop novel methods for mass rearing, shipping, and also different release techniques. Uh, and we'll continue this with our surveys in 2020 to see if there has been any persistence of the psyllid populations. In parallel with this, and based on the results that we were obtaining through um, Rapid Life, we conducted another survey in Japan with more of a climatic focus and collected from areas thought to be a better match uh, with the UK for new psyllid populations. So now we have new cultures, we are clearing up the cultures, conducting some more safety testing, and then subject to approval from DEFRA, hope to release new strains of the psyllid next year. This could fall outside the rapid life timeframe, but potentially could have a link to the afterlife that um, was just mentioned by Alexia. So Himalayan bias, balsam biocontrol, this is using a rust fungus. Uh, we have two strains, one from India, one from Pakistan. Releases first began in 2014 and then now releases at sites, uh, at 32 sites across the UK. Some DNA analysis done by CABI showed that there are three main groups of weed biotype within the UK, and these have different susceptibilities to the two rust strains that we hold. Um, so here's just showing some of the infection. So there's the leaf infection, uridinial stage, um, uh, and then the stem infection of esiospores on the seedling. Um, both of which can Im impact the population with the easier score stage able to actually kill some seedlings outright. Uh, and so through Rapid Life, it's enabled us to release uh, additional sites across the country. Again, Cabby's provided the training and gear, um, and then the regional coordinators have done the releases three times during the summer, uh, monitored the infection, and then reported back to Cabby so we can assess the results. Um, so 2019 results are still being assessed, but the rust was released at 10 sites in 2018, seven of which were provided through Rapid Life. Uh, unfortunately, this was the main sticking point for the Himalayan balsam biocontrol. None of the populations in the southwest or southeast were adequately susceptible to the rust strains that we hold. Um, so another positive outcome was successful overwintering at a number of sites, including five of those provided through Rapid Life. Um, so in summary, it's increased the number of sites and the geographic range of releases that we've been able to conduct. 38 populations of Himalayan balsam have been screened for susceptibility to the two strains that we hold of the fungus. 12 were suitable for release, and these were focused on the north, the Midlands, and the east of England, um, with good infection and uh, overwintering success at a number of sites where the rust is now considered established. The, again, the impact of the rust is likely a long-term um, outcome and may take five or 10 years to be seen. Uh, but the plan continuing from the results of the rapid life work is to focus on a new rust isolate that we're hoping to collect from India um, as soon as we're able to focus on plant populations in the southwest and southeast regions. And just a very quick thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Corin. Um, so I'm just going to whiz through the other bits and pieces. So in terms of delivery, um, we're also, sorry, I've got this coming up in the wrong order. We've got various workshops going on to raise awareness about um, biosecurity of IAS and also what we call priority species, so species that we particularly want to be looking out for. Um, we're piloting a water bodies accreditation scheme in uh, one of our regions called Aqua, which basically rewards water asset managers for excellence in biosecurity. So I think you might have heard one of my questions earlier, or statements probably, um, was about um, sort of incentivizing uh, commercial partners to get involved. So this is something we've been working on with some input from um, other commercial partners. So here are just a few of the things that we want to complete by uh, the end of the project. I won't go through those in detail because I know we're a bit running a bit short on time. Um, but basically, a lot of workshops. Um, also, a lot of awareness raising Ooh. and our end of project conference, which uh, all life projects have. And we're hoping to accredit uh, 60, at least 60 water bodies in, for our pilot accreditation scheme. Um, so in terms of the phases, uh, I mentioned the afterlife as well. The main point of the afterlife is to ensure the legacy of the project, to see that it's not just a project where you do it and then it finishes and then nothing happens and it all kind of dies. So we're hoping to try and continue and expand on um, some of our actions and also we'll be kind of monitoring the outcomes of the actual project and the implementation of the work that we've done. So all projects face challenges. I know the main sort of part of this... Um, talk was meant to be a little bit about the challenges. So, um, oh, okay, got this in the wrong order, sorry. Um, one of the main issues, like for everybody, is budgets and timeline. Um, so for an EU life bid, um, I think it's quite e hard to 
to get it all right in advance because you have to agree something quite a long time in advance for the proposal. Um, and there's also, you have to be careful not to underspend or overspend. But on the bright side, as it says in the solutions here, um, the EC are quite flexible. And if you can justify why you've changed something and it sits within the main remit of the project, they're normally quite accepting of it. Um, we had some legal issues, which I'm sure, again, some of you might um, f find. Oh, yourselves, sorry. Nope. Oops. Uh, mainly with issues with getting access to data. Um, in the UK in particular, a lot of um, recording data is very fragmented. Uh, it's sometimes owned privately. If you're a commercial organization, you're expected to pay for it. And because technically we are subcontracting people, we are expected to pay for some of it. Um, this wasn't really taken into account in our proposal, and so we ended up using a lot of anecdotal data and word of mouth, which is fine. But I think it's really important when you're planning this kind of project to think about um, data access and having good baseline data in place before you start to do things. Um, <clears throat> so again, that's just a bit like what I was just saying now in terms of technical issues, a lack of baseline data. It's good to set aside funding to be able to do some surveys and baseline data before deciding on your sites, but it's difficult when you're planning a long project. Um, I won't talk too much about the biocontrol because um, Corinne's already covered it, but um, as it turned out, there are multiple biotypes of this uh, rust fungus for Himalayan balsam, so that we had to be quite flexible and adapt to the situation. So we had some outstanding funds from the biocontrol. We're using it on awareness raising now. And um, also landowner permission for sites. You can try and do an entire catchment full of work, but if there's one guy in the river system who doesn't want you to go on his land and there's Himalayan balsam on that piece of land, it will just continuously reinfect so that can be really problematic. Um, I work for a government agency, which means that it's not always um, very quick when you're trying to get things done. Um, <laughs> so that means you need to do a lot of communication. Ideally, for partner organizations, have at least one point of contact. Ideally, one main person you speak to, because it's easy for communication to get lost. Um, and to do, I actually think doing meetings in person is really important, because when I'm on a teleconference, if lots of people are talking, it's hard to keep track of who's who. And I noticed I got a lot more out of the meetings with people in person. And again, planning all this stuff into the bid is really important. Um, we had a few issues with staff. Um, like any organization, if you have a change of staff, there's a hand over time. So again, I think just um, keeping communication going, keeping you know organized as much as possible, and having other people to talk to. For example, some of our subcontractors who had a good network of volunteers, they're self-employed. If they leave, there's nobody else to kind of take over what they're doing. So I think also when picking subcontractors to do some of your actions, that's quite important. Um, stakeholder engagement, always an issue with any project. It's very difficult to try and tell um, a project for the, um, for the stakeholders that actually you want them to be more coordinated and more strategic because that kind of implies that they're not. So you need to kind of really be careful about how you word things. Um, and also, if you've got lots of small groups of stakeholders like we had, make sure you split the money up a little bit in terms of contracts so that um, the, the money is spread evenly so it doesn't feel like one small group of people is getting all the funding. And plan planning the timing of the events is really important because um, with most field work projects, there's an element of seasonality. And if there's delays um, in getting the work done, that can also really put off stakeholders. So just a lot of planning required, really. Um, and a lot of them really struggle with the um, buy-in for the project. I'm just going to wind up now because I can see that Tim is edging towards me. Um, so a lot of this basically goes down to be as flexible as possible, plan as much as possible, and try and be um, you know, communicating as much as you can with your stakeholders and doing this stuff in the beginning. Um, if you want to know any more, please do grab me. I'm quite friendly. I don't bite. Um, I might not remember your face, so just you know, wave. Um, or contact my email address, or, which is on the leaflets, or look on our web pages. Thanks. Thank you, Corinne and Alexia. I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, move on to the next speaker immediately or we'll really run into trouble with our timing. So next uh, on the menu is uh, Martin de Groot, who is uh, coordinating the Artemis project on invasive species in forests in Slovenia. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, my name is Martin de Groot, um, from Slovenia, working at the Slovenian Forestry Institute. Uh, the, the name of the project is Life Artemis, uh, Awareness Raising, Training and Measures on Invasive Alien Species in Forests. Uh, I will present uh, the challenges on the management of invasive alien species in Slovenia. It's 
mainly an information project, so we tried to put some management in between, but it was more focusing to educate uh, and raising awareness among the uh, public. So, first, a very important part, Slovenia. Where is it? Um, on the left side, it's Italy, and it's on the south side of the, uh, and sunny side of the Alps. So, Austria on the north side, the west side, uh, east side is Croatia. Uh, we are also one of the most forested countries of Slovenia. 58% uh, of the uh, cover is covered with uh, forests. 75% uh, is uh, private forest, while uh, uh, only 22% is state forest. Uh, there are a lot of forest owners, which makes uh, it very problematic to make a really good uh, management plan or do a very good eradication because you have to do a lot of uh, 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 communication between the forest owners. However, on the other hand, these forest owners are also a lot into the, into the forests and they could be used for early detection of uh, invasive alien species. So, also in forests, there are a lot of uh, invasive alien species. Our project was focusing on uh, insects, plants, mammals, and pathogens, or fungi. Uh, we have, in Slovenia, a lot of different uh, pathways. Uh, and one of them is natural dispersion, uh, where uh, that will be probably Elena, but uh, tell more about it, but Italy is the, there where the most of the invasive alien species are coming from. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, an, a port in Koper in the southwestern part, and also in Ljubljana, uh, a lot of uh, goods are introduced. So these are places where we have to focus on if we were are working in a, uh, an early detection uh, and rapid response, uh, rapid response uh, system. So if you were all fam familiar probably with uh, how an invasion actually develops. So first you have the introduction, the establishment, and slowly it's, uh, it's becoming, uh, they're spreading more and more, and then it becomes really noticeable and it's also very hard to fight. So when do we want actually to focus on uh, uh, for measurements? I think the best not way how to do it is by early detection and rapid response. And that's on this point where um, the, it is only recently established or there are only a few individuals around, then it's still, uh, you can still do something against it. Um, a problem is that, uh, and a lot of countries have this problem, that uh, there are only a few experts working on invasive alien species, and so you can uh, not cover all the countries. But when you have a lot of people, there are a lot of citizen scientists around, they have a lot of, and then you have a lot of eyes in, this, in the field and you, you could, they could help you to detect this uh, particular species. Um, forests have uh, one advantage. Uh, they're not only covered by the EU uh, invasive alien legislation, but also the EU plant health legislation. So there are two very important tools. Um, the species covered by the plant health legislation are also species which affect the ecosystem. So also the biodiversity are really affected by these species, like the emerald ash borer who are affecting the ash, ash trees. Um, so our goal is uh, to contribute to the reduction of the harmful uh, impacts of invasive alien species on biodiversity. Uh, we want to increase the public awareness and setting up an effective early warning and rapid response framework uh, for uh, EIS in forests. It's a very small uh, chart how our uh, project was look like, did look like. Um, 
First, we had the preparatory actions. We had to develop a communication plan. We prepared a lot of uh, uh, materials for the trainings. And then when we were, went to the core actions, we had uh, the national awareness campaign, which was covered uh, over the whole country during the whole project. And in the beginning, we started to train the professionals and the volunteers to recognize, uh, the, recognize the species where we were interested in and, of course, uh, where they had to submit their data. Um, then we also prepared an information system and tried to collect a lot of information on uh, invasive alien species. Uh, and to show this, we, are, we had two case studies. One uh, air, F, F, looking at the one area on more invasive alien species and one on uh, one species uh, where we were focused on the whole country. And with, that, with this, we tried to see if this system was actually working. So I will slowly go through it, but uh, hopefully within time. Uh, we started with preparing an alert list, or definitely first a uh, list of species which we were interested in. Um, because we were working with uh, citizen scientists, we focused mainly on species which were easily recognizable. Uh, so we had chose 61 plant species, 26 insect species, and 20 fungi species, and one Phytophthora species. Uh, we, from these species, were some which were on alert list. Alert lists are species uh, which are not yet in Slovenia or have small populations, and still you can do something against it. And then you had the observation list, which was introduced because we actually wanted to know whether the people were in this area and they didn't find it or they simply didn't go there and therefore we didn't have any data over there. Uh, in this part, that we had some problems or challenges. Uh, there was no publicly available list of alien uh, species for Slovenian forests, so we first started to work on this, this one. Uh, and we also, uh, uh, so we went through a lot of uh, lo uh, local collections and uh, articles. Uh, we made a horizon scan for species for the alert list. So we also contacted people, uh, experts in the surroundings. We also international organizations. And another important question was also what species should be included for citizen scientists? Because we do you don't know, they, uh, some species especially if we're talking about fungi, you cannot uh, recognize them that easily, and you need molecular analysis in, in order to identify them. So we actually made already a pre-selection before we went out. These other species, of course, are also covered, but are covered by uh, other institutions. Um, then we started with awareness raising uh, and education. Uh, as I already told, there were uh, several workshops um, uh, to, uh, we, where we presented the, in, uh, in, uh, the system uh, of early, uh, early detection and rapid response. Uh, we also prepared um, uh, field work uh, where we actually showed uh, how people could recognize this, uh, this species where we were interested in. Um, of course, some were not there, but then we had just presentations. Um, we also prepared a very nice field guide. Um, and I uh, have to tell you that, let's say, after, uh, after a while, we were also thinking about an uh, English version. And together with uh, the cost alien CSI, we prepared a uh, translation and also some additional speci uh, species were included. And if you're interested, I still have some books here with me. Um, so Brussels Airlines allowed me to bring, say, if not anything else, uh, 20 additional copies. Um, yeah, there were some problems with, uh, with the workshops. Uh, certain stakeholders were not attending or were difficult to persuade, uh, especially the 
uh, the garden centers. And these were uh, often just uh, not coming. Uh, we had to do a lot of awareness uh, raising and education. Uh, we uh, had to advise uh, regarding the early warning and rapid response system for not re regulated uh, potential, potentially invasive alien species. Uh, because they could, they were not uh, covered by the uh, international regulations. Uh, there were also pro uh, many questions about economical interesting species, uh, where we just had to tell them, like, okay, sorry, this is uh, this is really a problem. Um, so we started with the uh, preparation of the information system in Vasilka. Um and now we have already 12,000, more than 12,000 observations. However, there were cer certain people who were more in, uh, active and some are not very active. And we were, st we were still thinking about it, how to deal with these people, how to get them actually active or have to get to find a new source of uh, people uh, do, uh, putting in data. Another thing is that some people are more interested in plants and me as an entomologist, I'm sorry that there are not so many insects around uh, in the database. Uh, another thing is that not all Slovenia is equally covered, but and the good part is that especially in the par places in the hotspots where, of, where uh, species are introduced in urban areas, there the most observations were done. So that's really good. Um, then that we were working with one, uh, we focused on one species, is the maple, uh, Utipella uh, canker of maple, which is actually a relatively unknown species, uh, which first introduced in uh, Slovenia. So we felt kind of obliged to do something against it. Uh, so we had to do a lot of uh, information uh, flow, awareness raising, education, uh, that people knew more about this, uh, a pathogen, um, but uh, and we got really a lot of uh, interesting data about it, and we're now going to uh, eradicate or mitigate the population by uh, cutting half of the uh, population, and if not anything else, more. Um, then uh, we were interested also in the urban uh, forestry uh, forests. Uh, this is uh, again. Uh, an interesting case because there's a lot of in potential invasive alien species. Uh, uh, invasive species uh, are mostly introduced over there. Uh, however, these actions, um, uh, we started with making inventory of invasive alien species and then did our eradications. But it's uh, interesting to see that, uh, um, that there were problems uh, with attracting volunteers for eradication uh, actions. Uh, that might be all uh, for many other people the case. Uh, that is uh, finding out eradication methods. We had one species which was actually a bush. Um, and we thought like, oh, this will be easy. But in the end, we used an, uh, a digging uh, machine to get the bush out and the uh, citizen scientists were only helping uh, with cutting the bushes uh, in, in order to, to get rid of them. So, Tim, this is the last slide. Uh, lessons learned. Um, so, for us, the system works in Slovenia. Uh, people are putting a lot of data inside uh, in Vasilka. Uh, people are now knowing more about uh, how to eradicate uh, this species. Um, we, uh, we realized that we actually need to invest a lot of time in awareness raising and education, ed education works, and that if we want to get something done, we should focus on one species uh, if we know that it's a uh, very high risk to be introduced in uh, Slovenia. Um, I think, let's say, if we're looking at the different taxa, uh, certain tax, it's, this will be always the case that certain uh, uh, taxa will be more popular by uh, people and that experts 
working more in professional sense uh, with other taxes which are not less popular have to take care of these ones. Um, I would like to thank you very much. Um, if you want to know a little bit more, uh, on the upper side is our, uh, our uh, website. Uh, one is in Vazilka. And as I also already said, if you're interested uh, in the field guide, I still have some uh, copies left. But that can be after the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for sharing that. Are there any pressing questions from the audience? We have room for one question. Susanna. Thank you. I was curious to what extent stakeholders have been involved in developing these rapid response information systems and also in the brochures. Um, actually, uh, the development of the brochures were done by the project group. But this project group uh, exists out of an NGO uh, and the uh, forest uh, surf, uh, Slovenian Forest Service, but let's say uh, forest owners were not taken in, uh, were not uh, taken into account with okay. preparation. Okay, and did you collect any feedback from them on how they perceived it, if they found it useful? Yes, they uh, we got this information from them. Okay. Thanks again. Next on the program is a talk about a project that my institute is also involved with. It's on the muskrat and koipu management across borders in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. So, Margriet. Thank you. I just decided to do the presentation in English. So maybe I could catch up in time because my vocabulary is less in English than in, in Dutch. So we'll get to the network drink earlier or on time. Uh, I'm uh, Margreet van Wielige. I uh, work uh, for the department Muskrat, Muskrat Control uh, for four water boards. There are 21 water boards in uh, the Netherlands and we have eight trapping organizations all organized by the water boards. Um, but that's not where, uh, why I'm here today. I'm talking about our, our life project with uh, partners from Belgium and Germany. Uh, in the Netherlands we are trapping muskrats and koipu already for, I think, 30 years, 40 years almost, um, professionally. Uh, and that's not everywhere in Europe. So um, I'm very proud that we have that professional organization. Uh, but it costs a lot of money, as Hank said this morning, 34 million for uh, trapping muskrat and 1 million uh, for koipu, because the koipu will only have German koipu we only catch them at the border uh, at this time. So we'll try to keep them there. But uh, in cooperation with Germany, we try to catch the Kopu uh, also in Germany. And I think it's uh, in all of our interest to work together in what kind of management of what kind of IAS it is. It shouldn't matter. Um, the project Mika Management of Invasive, safe, invasive Koipu and Muskrat in Europe uh, we have 11 areas where we're trying to um, implement some innovations. Um, that's one of uh, the goals of our project is innovation. Uh, I think it's the fun part, but we also want to learn from each other and create awareness uh, at stakeholders, external stakeholders, to um, let them know why we are killing these animals, because that's... Um, the difficulty of our job. Um, the life project, we just started, so I can tell you some of the problems, by, but I'm afraid the most problems are yet to come. So I don't have any solutions, but maybe within a couple of years I can tell you some solutions in another uh, meeting. Um, we started in September this year, and of course the whole part of the um, the start, we started, I think, I think one and a half year ago, talking about this project. It takes a lot of time before you are there uh, to have the co-funding. 
the co-funding is 55% of the 3 million. We get 1.6 million from the European Commission. Um, and we are with eight partners from the Netherlands, from Belgium, and from Germany. We have uh, four main goals. I try to keep it short. Effective and efficient uh, control of the muskrat and the koipu. And uh, especially in the Netherlands and in Belgium, uh, the problem is the flooding. Uh, if the muskrat can, I don't know how to say it in English, I think one cubic meter in a dike, he can dig it in one year. And um, about 10 years ago, we trapped 400,000 muskrats in the Netherlands. We, and at this point, I guess it's like 50,000 uh, in, in the Netherlands. So we did a good job, but there's still a lot of them. And if they can dig in the dikes, we have the risk of flooding. So that's the water safety problem that uh, you can convince a lot of people uh, why you are trapping the muskrat because of the water safety. But not all people are convinced of that problem. Um, we had a lot of research, uh, but they still are not convinced of the scientific research we've done. So that's why I told you this morning that it helps us that the European legislation says you also have to trap them because of the ecosystem and biodiversity. It's a new argument. Uh, then the protection of the ecosystems, yes, that helps us a lot in this, uh, in this project. And uh, agriculture damage, yeah, that's not the main reason, but it's uh, like farmers, they're pleased that we trapped the muskrat and koipi because there's a lot of land damaged and a lot of digging done uh, on um, their land. We have four uh, innovation ideas well, they're good ideas, so it's more than an idea. Uh, we have intelligent life traps, and um, we catch koipu in life traps. They close at the moment the uh, animal enters, and now we're trying to, um, to make it that smart that the camera recognizes if there's a koipu or a muskrat in the cage, and then it closes, and otherwise it stays open. So we are now trying to develop, uh, de uh, develop uh, the images, and uh, we hope to have the prototypes ready uh, in the first or second, the second uh, part of, no, that's not true, in May 2020, we have 50 prototypes to test in the 11 areas. Uh, then we have the DNA mapping. I think it kind of speaks for itself, but it's, um, we're trying to find out if we can make um, DNA, uh, we, we can find the DNA out of the muskrats and then look at their familiar muskrats of their family, like in the northern part of the Netherlands and in the south of the Netherlands. And we hope we can find out something more about migration routes, routes and um, we can see where they're going or where they're not going and how much they're related or not. Um, we try to, make a map of it in all the areas eventually, but we start in the areas where there are not a lot of mus muskrats left. Um, then we have the eDNA. We are trying to uh, find out how we can use in our management of the muskrat uh, DNA um, samples out of the water, but there's a risk of contamination and that sort of things. There's uh, a lot of time taken by uh, um, research on the water samples. So we're trying to make it better and faster and we're Dutch cheaper. So uh, that's a challenge, but I think it's a very good um, innovation that we can try to use when there are not a lot of muskrats, when the population is low, so we can find the last muskrat and eradicate in some areas the muskrat or koipu in the future. At this point, eDNA is only used for muskrat, but you can use it eventually also for the koipu, is our convention. Um, then the wildlife camera, the intelligent wildlife camera, not, not a normal wildlife camera, that can see, just as the intelligent trap, is there a muskrat or a koipu? Uh, and it, can we get a sign that it's there? And then we know it enters an empty area. So we know we have to look 
the, uh, we have to search for the muskrat in that area. And if they're not, we know that's empty and we can check it with the eDNA. And so we have to try to combine all these innovations into the management. Uh, the challenges, yes, as I told you, we just started. So yes, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, no, not that much solutions yet. Um, but what we're uh, already finding out is that we uh, did not exchange that lot of knowledge and that we learn a lot from just talking to each other on networking events or just when you're preparing your life project. You get to know each other better and you get to learn more about other organizations and how they, um, they handle uh, the IAS management. Um, migration, I told you before, we have the DNA mapping. There's not a lot uh, we know about the migration of the muskrat. We do know something, but we need to combine it. And DNA mapping is going to help us to get more insight in the migration. Well, yeah, I told you about the cages. Uh, there's another. It's not only for us that we can catch them efficient and effective, that we just had to go to the, to the smart cage because there is a muskrat or a koi poo in it, but also there are no bycatches. And we try to, um, to take that also in, in the discussions with, um, we have the party of, for the animals, uh, it's a political party, and in that kind of discussion I can use uh, the decrease of uh, bycatches. But it's, uh, it's difficult to convince them, but it's, it's something. Um, yeah, the effective way to catch animals, that's one of the most important things I think we have to be thinking of constantly. It's not something of today, of, of a project. It has to be for now and in the future. Um, yes, we're trying to start with this small part of Europe and we're hoping to uh, invent and uh, gather that much knowledge that we can spread it all over Europe and we can share all the knowledge with all of you, and not, maybe not only because of the muskrat and the koi but all other invasive species that are coming to us and that we already know of that's going to be a problem. So we have to organize also in the communication part um, uh, the sharing knowledge uh, uh, meetings. That's why we're here too, to let us um, inform about your knowledge about uh, other invasive species, but also um, to get to know each other for the future. Yes, challenges, uh, especially, especially in the muskrat and koi poo control, there's a lot of differences in the law and the legislation, not only uh, between countries, but also between provinces, between organizations, between countries, uh, and that makes it difficult to do the same thing at the same time and agree on a lot of things, how to manage the muskrat or the koi poo. A politics, I mentioned it before, and uh, also Hank said it, uh, in the Netherlands we have 17 million opinions and uh, along the way with the partners from Germany and Belgium, I got to know that not only in the Netherlands there are 17 million experts, but also in the other countries there are a lot of opinions of what to do with invasive alien species. And uh, communication is important, but also sometimes you have to know that you can't convince some of these people. And, and I think we have to deal with it and we have to live with it and accept it. And we will always have to um, make, um, how do I say that? make sure that we are as open, as transparent as we can be in what we're doing. And I think then you have as less enemies if you, if you, uh, as you can have. Well, the challenges within the project, pure uh, the administration part, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And um, we hired someone to, to help us um, along the way. Uh, so, time, 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 and schedule it, and um, yeah, I, I think we, um, we underestimated it a bit. So now we started, and we have some delays, we were 
going on and it's going strong. But um, yeah, the start is kind of rocky. And I think we'll, uh, if you talk to me about it, within a year, I'll be uh, catching up in time on the schedule, probably. Thank you for your time. We don't have a website yet, but it will be there. And I think it's good if we, uh, we can spread it through the organization so you have our website when it's ready. Thank you very much. That's right. We'll, uh, we'll try to make all the presentations available on uh, the conference website after this is over. Um, any questions on muskrat or koipu management across borders for Marguerite? What were your bycatch animals? Can I do it? I'll, I'll talk to you in Dutch. So um, maybe Tim can help me. Um, brown rats, I can tell that in English, but the wool, uh, the wool mice, uh, wool rats. Wool rats. Water voles. And uh, probably. Chinese mitten crabs. But most of it is brown rats, and that's not an issue in the Netherlands. I don't know if it's with you, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. Sometimes we have a duck or a sheep, but that's not that common. Yeah, we do. But uh, most of it, uh, Wolhans cover and uh, <laughs> So most of it is wanted bycatch. That's, yeah. it's, it's not unwanted bycatch, it's mostly wanted bycatch, so far. And with the traps becoming more intelligent, we hope this will solve this problem. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Margit. Um, our next speaker is Elena Tricarico from Florence University. And uh, we're very lucky that she's here because in fact she's going to present a range of uh, life projects. There are so many in Italy that uh, it would have been impossible. We could have organized a whole day on Italian projects alone. So, Elena. Thank you. Uh, is there a pointer, Tim? Sorry. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk here. It's a great pleasure. Um, as I told you this morning, in Italy we have more than 3,000 of alien species, uh, and have you seen that our neighbor countries fear us because we can spread <laughs> these this species towards them. And 15% of these species are invasive, so we have a lot of problems. And we have to manage these species. Um, has uh, uh, emerged also by the, uh, the, the first report for the EU regulation. Uh, we are using and we use the life as an instrument for managing these invasive species. And since 1996, we have uh, more than 50 projects funded under the LIFE program. Just to give you an idea, in the last 10 years, we have more than 20 projects for, uh, for a budget of about 60 million. So, uh, we are investing a lot of uh, money in life projects to uh, tackle the, the, the issue of invasive species. So uh, we have a lot of uh, projects. So we decided to uh, carry out uh, uh, to carry out a first screening about this project. And from a preliminary analysis of available online database, we retrieved information on about 44 projects. Uh, most of these projects are partially focused on invasive alien species. And as you can see, local authorities, uh, meaning uh, the um, provinces or municipalities, followed by protected areas and regional authorities, were the most frequent coordinators of these life projects. Uh, the <coughs> Oh, fantastic. Okay, but I can, I can explain. So you can see the red part. Okay, the, the most, uh, the, the big portion of the, this cake uh, is uh, prevention, uh, no, sorry, uh, eradication and control activities. So most of the life projects are dealing with uh, eradication and control activities, while the smallest part is uh, related to prevention activities. And, uh, uh, the life projects equally tackle 
um, animal and plant species, mainly in freshwater environments followed by terrestrial environments. And as you can see from the graph on the right side of the slide, uh, we also have many projects with dealing with invasive species on islands and quite successful project, uh, eradication of rats and the eradication also of invasive plants. These are the top uh, species we are managing uh, within this life project. So you can see for the animals, we have the rest from crayfish, but it's not my fault, I'm sorry, because I'm not involved in, in all these life projects. So then we have rats, and then we have the gray squirrels, then we have the red here terrapins, and then we have the well catfish. That is quite a huge problem in Italy. For the plant, we have many projects dealing with the fig autentot. Uh, because it, this is a species particularly problematic in the Mediterranean environment. And then we have the Rubinia, Amorpha, and the Lantus. And just to uh, remind you that some of these species are now in the list of union concern uh, linked to the EU regulation. So we started to manage these species before uh, the, the EU regulation. Um, so considering the higher number of life projects, we decided to establish uh, an Italian network of uh, life projects dealing with invasive alien species in Italy. And with uh, the main aims to facilitate the implementation of some pillars of the life program, like replication and networking, to spread the circulation of information, experience and solutions, and to exploit the technical skills acquired during the life program, because we have now many experts dealing with invasive species in Italy. And the network is coordinated by the Institute for Environmental Protection and Research, ISPRA. Valentina Lamoggia is here, and she pre represents that institute. And up to now, 31 projects officially joined the network. And uh, here from the graph, you can see the cumulative number of projects uh, funded by uh, the life on in, and, and related to invasive alien species. So there is an increasing trend in Italy. And so we hope to involve all these projects in the network. And the new entries just a few months ago are these projects listed here on the left, so our projects the, that are working on forestry, on island again, and on aquatic environments. We asked to the um, projects in the network to provide us some information about uh, their budget. So how, um, how, how, how much is the proportion of budget spent for the management of invasive alien species in the project, and how much is the proportion spent for communication activities related to invasive alien species. And as you can see from the uh, left bar, on average, 24% of the budget is dedicated to uh, management actions. And we have two projects, the SOS Tuscan Wetlands and Rest of Home Life, uh, that invested a lot of money in management activities, more than 70% of their budget, because they tackled a lot of invasive animal and alien plants, and so they, they, needed, they needed a lot of money for these management activities. On the, on the right bar, the yellow one, you can see that on average, uh, these projects uh, spend 60% of their budget on communication. But also here we have some exception. Uh, you can see three projects listed there. So we have the life ASAP, but this is quite normal because this is an information project, so it's completely devoted to communication. Then you have user reds, uh, life nature uh, dealing with the conservation of red squirrel and controlling the gray squirrel. So uh, people involved in this project uh, foster the communication because uh, in order to have the public support for controlling the gray squirrel. And then the last project is a rarity project. And this project uh, aimed at uh, conservation of the uh, European native uh, white cloak crayfish, controlling the rest of crayfish. Luckily, the rarity project uh, was uh, conducted in Friuli Venezia Giulia, so north uh, 
east of Italy, on the border with Slovenia. <laughs> and we, there we have a very few population of the rest from uh, crayfish, so they were promoting a lot of campaign to prevent the spread of the rest from crayfish, so they invested a lot of money again in communication. Uh, so, as our further steps for the network, we would like to enlarge uh, the network. We would like to collect the evidences of the impact uh, caused by the invasive species in Italy, and also the management costs and the effects of these management activities uh, in Italy. Uh, we would like to share knowledge and experience in order to improve uh, communication and action and raise awareness about this topic. And last but not least, we would like to develop technical reports and organize information events like this one uh, for local authorities involved in the invasive uh, species management. So as part of the network, I will show you now a couple of projects. Um, one is Life Nature, uh, classical Life Nature, and the other one is uh, Life Information. So the first one is uh, SOS Tuscan Wetlands. Uh, it ended at the beginning of this year. And the main aim was to stop the loss of biodiversity of two wetland areas in Tuscany, um, so north century, central Italy, controlling some invasive alien species, meaning uh, the koipu, the red swan crayfish, false indigo bush, and the black locust, and uh, restoring the habitats. I will show briefly uh, the main results of this project. So for the crayfish, we had a reduction of 74% and 55% in the catch per unit effort in the two project areas. Uh, we used a total of 182 traps for 171 trapping uh, days. And the, in the brackets, you can see the number of trapped crayfish, so more than uh, 100,000 uh, trapped crayfish. For the koipu, we had some problems because we had a, a change in the, in the legislation and so uh, we didn't know at a certain point who was the uh, authority responsible for managing the species. So uh, there, there was a stack in this activity. And so we started to trap the koi pool last year uh, only in one of the project area, and we trapped 24 koipu using mainly the um, life cage on floating rats. Um, but the activities are still ongoing in the post-life uh, phase, so we hope to have much more results now this year and next year. And next year. For the plants, uh, for the false indigo bush, we uh, performed two repeated cuttings of the species for a total of 20 hectares. You, here you can see from the pictures the two study areas. And after two cuttings, we are observing that the native species are coming back. So we have to repeat again another cuttings to have a much more uh, robust result. And for the black uh, locust, we cut and then painted with glyphosate uh, the species uh, on a surface of two hectares. On the left, you can see uh, you can see the, the cut the trees, and then on the other side, on the right part, you can see we planted new native trees instead of the, of the black locust. So this is, uh, these are the main results coming from these uh, life nature projects. Now, the other uh, life projects I want to talk about is the life up. So this is a life information. Uh, the acronym means uh, Alien Species Awareness Program, but we decided to use this acronym because in English means as soon as possible, even if we are in late. We are late. So the main aims are contributing to the implementation of the EU regulation and to raising awareness of Italian citizens about this topic. And uh, in order to favor the adoption of these codes of conduct, so of best practice, good practice, to mitigate the problems. And there are a lot of actions because the project will finish next year, still ongoing, so we have many communication, information, and training campaigns uh, directed towards several uh, stakeholders. And again, just to remind you, we want to facilitate the implementation of the EU regulation, but also of the national decree I was talking about uh, this morning. And then we want to support the voluntary adoption of the good practices, meaning the uh, spread and adoption of the codes of conduct. 
And these are the activities. I tried to summarize in a slide, but uh, trust me, we are, me and my colleagues are traveling all around Italy. That is quite interesting um, because we can taste also different dishes and different traditions. But anyway, uh, for the preparatory reactions, we train in the multipliers. So we train in more than 500 people uh, working with uh, education in educational activities in museums, uh, zoological gardens, uh, botanical gardens, and aquaria. And then now there are several actions still ongoing. Two are dealing with the regulatory measures because we, train a, we are training the public bodies and the authorities responsible for the implementation of the EU regulation and national decree. And then we involved uh, the scientific community in Italy to draft the list of invasive alien species of national relevance. It's a quite interesting, it's a quite interesting process, I have to say. <laughs> And then we have several actions dealing with the voluntary measures, meaning the codes of conduct. So we uh, drafted the guidelines for protected areas and we are um, spreading uh, the, these guidelines in the protected areas. We are increasing the awareness of anglers and hunters, botanical and zoological gardens, aquaria, and their visitors. Uh, we are talking with retailers, trying to make them more aware about the problem, and we are training the professionals who are involved in, in their daily life with the invasive alien species, like uh, architects, uh, biologists, uh, um, forestry, and so on. And then we are increasing the awareness of travelers at airports. We have a permanent stand uh, that is open regularly, um, uh, that inform the travelers about the issue of invasive alien species. And then we have uh, a couple of actions uh, for the general public. So um, we develop uh, kid laboratories. We launch the photo contest. We are now in, um, under the second edition. edition. And when we, then we run citizen science campaigns. The, these are the relevant products of the, this life project. So you can see we translated in Italian all the codes of conduct related to invasive alien species and developed under the Bern Convention. And so we translated and uh, ad adapted to the local situation. Then we developed the guidelines for protected areas and uh, we drafted the technical guide for multipliers, for professionals, for public bodies and authorities. And then in Cagliari, uh, in Sardinia, they, uh, they have now an invasive alien flora path and we hope to replicate this path also in other botanical gardens. Then we developed educational kit for schools and ed educational materials for travelers. And then we launched a specific app, as app, for encouraging citizens to detect and monitor several alien species on the territory. And then we developed this laboratory for kids that is called Alien Alarm. And the last but not least, we are developing this list of alternative plants for the retailers, for the horticulture. And also we are developing this black list of national concern um, for the, following the EU regulation. So, as network, as an Italian network of life project on invasive alien species, we want to uh, suggest you a couple of ideas. First one, uh, also Alexia mentioned before, one of the main issues is that uh, we should have a, a financial tool uh, to ensure the afterlife sustainability of the life projects, because sometimes the main issue is that once the project ends, you don't have much more money, and so we don't have much more possibility to uh, maintain the results. And the second one, and I think this is a very good opportunity, is what about a European-wide network, or even a cost action? I'm looking at team, at Sonia, like, uh, I think you, <laughs> you have a very long tradition about management of invasive alien species. So we are here because we need, uh, we, we are feeling the need to connect each other. So uh, I think we should take the opportunity and try to um, develop this network uh, in, re in reality in some way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the people working in the network and uh, on the life project I mentioned.
Thank you, Elena. I want to say yes already. <laughs> well, I know I shouldn't. Uh, are there any questions for Elena? Um, he hello, Elena. I would like to know um, who is financing the activities uh, under this network? If who it is financing the activities in the network, the, the activities <laughs> it's voluntary. That you it is voluntary. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then I wanted to ask, uh, what is there in the edu in the educational kits that you just mentioned, uh, addressed to schools and to travelers? What is yeah, there inside? Okay. Uh, for the kids, uh, they develop a sort of uh, fact sheets, a sort of games uh, for according to the different ages, and they also develop this uh, um, laboratory. Um, it was quite successful at the Genoa Science Festival two years ago. It's a national festival about uh, science activities, science educational activities, and they just um, uh, mimic uh, Hay House with different rooms and different staff, and they, and they alert uh, kids to look for some species because they can bring uh, unintentionally these species um, once coming back from a uh, travel. So, and once kids find the species in this fourth house, they start talking about um, these species, and then they have a sort of big panel uh, representing the world, and so they are trying to explain how the species are moving and in a physical way um, with the... Filo di lana, non mi viene, sorry. Uh, with a sort of rope, something like this. It's, it's a very rough summary, I'm sorry, but if you want, we can talk much more. And for travelers, you have this uh, uh, mm, recommendation like uh, uh, be aware, no, think, be aware and travel, and in order that you can, tra you can still travel, but please be aware not to take with you some parts of animals and plants. And they have a game, an educational game, like a memo game at the airport also for kids. So they uh, learn to recognize the species and what mm, these species can do. Um, they have a tag for the luggage. They have a lot of gadgets so they can bring uh, with them and uh, have a sort of uh, um, a proof, or a sort of uh, memory of this, uh, of this experience. It's a very rough way, yeah, but I can sp explain better later if you want. In the website, most of the ma uh, all the materials are available. Most of the material is in Italian, I'm sorry, but for the travelers, we have also the English version. Because we reached more than 5,000 uh, travelers uh, speaking also in English, French, I think also some Asiatic language, I don't remember which one, anyway. Uh, yeah. Can I? Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned that the, the majority of the project uh, focus uh, on, uh, on management of invasive alien species. Yes. And only few dealing with uh, prevention. Yes. I was wondering what's the reason for that? Is it the, st the structure of the life program that is more suitable for management or is question of priorities? I think because, uh, yes, for the structure, so the people start in uh, conducting practical action, management actions, so because we have so many species on the area, so we started in this way. But now we are considering more also the prevention, considering that it's it, it the best way to mitigate the, the, the problem. So I think it's also a temporal trend. I'm pretty sure that there will be a change. Hi, Elena. Okay, uh, I was just wondering about the issue that you raised about the afterlife sustainability, because for instance, for your SOS Tuscan wetlands, for the crayfish control measures that you use, I mean, it's amazing the number of animals that you caught, but in the long run, will it, if you don't continue and sustain those measures, will it actually have an impact? I mean, crayfish, of course, are a special case, we know, but um, yeah, I mean, it might be different for other species, but for instance, in this case, I mean, do you, I guess you don't know what actually, you know, if you're going to have any money to follow up or not, but 
Uh, okay. Uh, for the plants, it's more easy because the the private owners of the, the areas, because we we have this strange situation in Italy that uh, many of the protected areas are uh, often private. So the private owners agree to cut uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, in, I mean, in um, once and twice uh, the plants, so it's quite easy. Uh, for the koipu, also the private owners at the end agree to help with the um, chopping. And for crayfish, yes, they also agree, but uh, with their own resources. So we hope this, they, they will still continue to do this kind of activities. Um, thank you for your um, very informatic and interesting talk. I actually have a question to the crayfish. As well, I'm not sure if you can answer that since you just use it as an example, but since I'm working um, with aquatic systems as well, I'm quite interested in how you caught them because there was these pictures, but how did you get that just the crayfish were inside uh, or did you later on separate the other fish or whatever was inside the trap as well? Yeah. And what did you later on with the crayfish? What did you do with them? Did you kill them or...? Yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> this is the first answer, yes. Um, um, okay, we use the, these baited traps. They are not species-specific, so species-specific. So the recommendation is, all, is always to set these traps semi-submerged. So if you have terrapins, if you have snakes, and if you have sometimes also birds and uh, mammals, uh, you can um, keep them alive. So. Because, for example, we uh, we had in the traps uh, uh, a koibu, but it was uh, like the non-target species mentioned before. It was not bad for us. Then uh, we had several fishes, but it's quite uh, easy. And then we have the protected native terrapins, but alive, so we were able to release them as well as uh, uh, chicks of some aquatic birds. I have to mention also that in the, in the study, in the two study areas, we have a, lot, a huge number of aquatic birds helping us because they feed on the juveniles and the um, small size crayfish, while the traps usually catch the medium large size crayfish. Thanks again, and we'll chat about crayfish management later during the break. Uh, moving on to the southeast. Um, I'm glad to introduce the project IS Free Habitats and Grasslands uh, from Bulgaria. Hello, my name is Svetla Ojem, and I'm, I'm going to present together with my colleague, Dimi Poteva, and another colleague of ours is here. He's the forester is out in our team, Vasco is sitting over there, so we are an interdisciplinary team, and we'll be happy to present uh, what we've managed already, and what are our challenges. Maybe... Uh, as it was already established as a practice to say where we're coming from. Bulgaria, uh, to the east, it's the, the Black Sea, to the south, Greece and Turkey, uh, to the north, Romania and uh, uh, Macedonia and uh, Serbia. These are our borders. As you have heard, this is a project, the LIFE project. I want to acknowledge very much the LIFE program that gives us all the opportunity to implement so many interesting and important activities. It's called IAS Free Habitats, IAS Free Habitats, but actually we're also doing, as a main focus, we're doing maintenance of uh, four important uh, habitats, two of which are of 
high priority, but uh, my colleague will present more. I would like to uh, put a stress on the type of beneficiaries. It's bringing a little bit of diversity, I believe, among the presenters so far. We are uh, an NGO, a foundation. Our, our organization is a foundation. And we have two associated beneficiaries working with us who, who are also uh, NGOs. So I'll pass it to Dini to present the objectives and the habitats and species. She is our botanist, <laughs> by the way. Thank you, Svetla. Uh, so uh, we are working in uh, three Natura 2000 sites, uh, which are here in uh, three different colors. Uh, in the middle of uh, Bulgaria uh, and uh, in the south part, neighboring Greece. The overall uh, objectives of the project, as Svetlana said, is um, uh, maintenance of these uh, habitats and uh, improvement of their status. But part of the activities uh, is include also EAS management and eradication. Uh, so the uh, four habitats are two grassland habitats, uh, 6510, which is lowland hay meadows, and 652 semi-natural dry grasslands. These are uh, speaking <coughs> not in the terminology of uh, the, the habitats directive, uh, meadows and pastures, and two priority habitats, which are forests. Uh, these are uh, Tilius area on forests of slopes and screes and endemic forests with uh, juniperus uh, species. Uh, the latest one is quite uh, interesting and challenging. All of them are challenging, but this one is in particularly special because uh, this is a very real, rare habitat uh, distributed in the Mediterranean. In uh, the case of Bulgaria, it includes Juniperus excelsa, the so-called Grecian juniper. Uh, and uh, among the habitat, there are other five, four more uh, Juniperus species, and it's distributed only in the Mediterranean area, Greece, Cyprus, <laughs> Portugal, I think, in North Macedonia also. And this is a um, habitat which has a lot of problems, and one of them is the EIS invasion. It is quite open forest. And our targeted uh, EIS species are uh, only um, plants, and uh, these are among uh, the most widespread species, not only in Bulgaria, but uh, in Europe. Black locust, indigo bush, and tree of heaven. So this is the scope, uh, and uh, one of the uh, Natura 2000 areas is also a national park, category two, uh, according to IUCN, it's protected area. Uh, where is the um, Tilio Aserion forests um, are distributed and we work with. The other one is uh, with the Juniperus excelsa forests in a managed nature reserve. And uh, uh, two grasslands are in Natura 2000 areas, but they are not protected areas under the national legislation. Okay, what are our main challenges? Actually, uh, in the run of the project, uh, we have uh, learned a lot. And uh, it started with our first um, open meeting at which we invited all the people and scientists, academics, every expert in country who has ever done anything on IAS. And uh, we expected to receive lots of advice and um, to have many people suggesting us doing um, any sort of activities. However, we were very surprised to hear that everyone, uh, even the most conservative scientists, advised us only one thing, and it was to work as much as we can with the general public. Uh, they all were convinced after many years of, uh, of their experience that this is the only, the main, the major issue we have with uh, the spread of um, this, this dangerous species. So they told us from the beginning of the project, we have to do, uh, you have to do a lot. And uh, in reality, we were very, we were trying to be as flexible as possible to um, 
use all the resources of our project and additional ones, of course, uh, to do uh, as much as we can, um, public awareness, uh, trainings, uh, exchange of information, but I'll tell you a little bit more as we, as we go. Another um, real serious challenge that we face is that uh, for good or bad, uh, the, um, the policy issues on national level are not being uh, addressed as, uh, as quickly as we expected. So uh, we are now uh, two years after the start of the project and there is still nothing done on national level in order to um, spread the responsibilities uh, to organize uh, the institutions and even to establish uh, the, uh, the most important uh, legislative parts um, on, the, on the government side. So these are real uh, challenges and this um, also makes us uh, think uh, very creatively of how can we be uh, most uh, effective in, in what we do. So what we are doing uh, now, uh, from the beginning of the project, we are actually um, uh, putting a lot of effort in um, pushing the things to, to go in, this di in the right direction from the bottom up. Uh, as we realize that it's, it might, hopefully not, but it is quite possible that by the end of the project, nothing really uh, important will happen <laughs> from from uh, the top down in means of uh, legislation and establishing uh, national uh, policy. So uh, we'll tell you more um, about uh, how we exactly um, doing this uh, work with the uh, stakeholders. You probably um, realize that um, it's in the name of our project, uh, this um, uh, expression collaborative management it's a key expression for, for the work we're doing. Um, we are trying to establish um, groups, we can call them working groups, but they're more than this, because we hope that those groups of, uh, of uh, institutions, of representatives of institutions, will continue to, to, to uh, act after the end of the project and will continue uh, to implement some of the activities uh, so to um, uh, ensure some uh, sustainability. Um, and what these collaborative management platforms uh, actually uh, are going to be um, developed, are being developed through a series of meetings and joint activities with the uh, main uh, stakeholders for each of the four habitats in which we are uh, doing our direct conservation work. Uh, and these are the, the main um, goals that we expect to achieve, um, to gain experience of all the representatives of institutions in, uh, in improving the conservation status, to make them realize their responsibilities because uh, unfortunately, in many of the cases, uh, those people, those experts uh, still don't know uh, how can they be related to the issues of uh, the uh, IS uh, spread. And of course, we, we hope, we believe that by the end of the project, we shall be able together to uh, make a list of effective measures for uh, control and eradication. Uh, there is one, um, a major activity of the project that is uh, planned to happen in the last year. It's a five-year project. Uh, we are uh, to, to organize a national event uh, where to uh, not only represent the results of the project, but to bring uh, all the um, representatives of uh, key stakeholders together so they can speak for themselves what they have done and what they have, are planning to do and also to, um, to sign um, an agreement. It's, an, it's going to be probably an informal one, but we hope that it will be a really um, a good sign of uh, declaring their um, commitment to continue to do some work uh, in this uh, perspective. And also one of the, of course, one of the expectations we put on this uh, agreement <coughs> 
is uh, that uh, the, the measures, uh, the effects, the results will be spread in um, the whole country and especially in uh, other territories of the same habitats that we are focusing on. Uh, this is a, <laughs> a scheme that presents uh, the um, main uh, stakeholders and how they are related so, to it. We are not going to uh, spend much time, but just to give you an idea uh, of how uh, the institutions are interrelated uh, between themselves in, in our country and uh, with whom we are obliged to work, to do really serious work. Uh, the example is uh, with the uh, habitats we are working with, uh, but still it's the, the national level and uh, we are more focused on working on regional and local level. Uh, in the legislation, uh, the regulation 1143 uh, is included mainly as uh, uh, the, with the provision in the Biodiversity Act that the Ministry of Environment of Bulgaria is the responsible institution to, co to coordinate and to organize activities uh, concerning the EAS um, uh, issues. Uh, then the Ministry of Environment uh, has uh, a certain uh, number of regional structures, regional inspectorates of environment, and also under the, the Ministry of Environment are the directorates of the three national parks. Uh, category two in Bulgaria. So uh, with the um, two forest habitats, we do work with one of the regional inspectorates and uh, one of the national park directorates. And then uh, we have the Ministry of Agriculture, Forests and Food, uh, which is responsible for the forests through the uh, Executive Forest Agency. Uh, and through six state forest uh, enterprises, the country is uh, di uh, divided in six uh, big uh, areas. Uh, our project works in the Central South uh, Forest Enterprise, which has a certain number of uh, forest uh, units. Uh, so they are um, not directly responsible for the forest that we work in because it's a managed res uh, res uh, reserve but they are responsible, the foresters are responsible for uh, forests around it. And if we don't work with uh, them, uh, there is no matter if we, uh, if we manage to eradicate the um, black locust uh, or amorpha uh, in our area if they do not uh, take part in the adjacent areas. Uh, so these are the part of forest, uh, uh, foresters. And then in the uh, agricultural part, we do work with municipalities who are owners of pastures and uh, meadows, and they rent them usually uh, for management, direct field management to farmers, and also private owners, which are the farmers uh, themselves, uh, which are responsible to manage the grassland habitats. And uh, frankly speaking, this is one of the most difficult uh, stakeholder groups that we work with, the farmers, and if uh, any of you has more experience in involving them, we will be really happy to speak now or uh, after on the drink part, how do you manage to involve farmers? Because in Bulgaria, the um, situation is that they are interested only if they have a measure in the rural development program and they have subsidies. Otherwise, they are really, really not interested. In participating at all. Yeah. <laughs> so w what do we do um, together with the stakeholders? Uh, we, as I said, we are trying to be uh, very flexible and creative. And even uh, when... Um, I want to show you our uh, 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 Facebook page. But I, let me see whether I'll manage. <laughs> Manage. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when we established the, the, um, the Facebook page at the beginning of the project, uh, we were really worried because it's a, for the first time uh, we have had other projects, even on, on the live program, uh, when uh, for several months uh, we were able to reach thousands of followers. But this time, 
naming our Facebook page with two words that meant nothing to the general public, habitats and invasive, it was really very, very difficult to raise uh, interest. So now, um, two years later, uh, I can say that uh, uh, we learned the lesson uh, and uh, w I think we, we managed to um, create some interest and to, to gain um, some supporters uh, because we um, broadened very much uh, the subjects and the list of species. Uh, we started uh, exploring and sharing information and providing uh, valuable, in useful information for the general public about any invasive alien species, no matter where, whether they were plants or animals, um, in order to be uh, helpful to the general audience. And uh, we followed the, this interest and we answered all the questions that were burning uh, questions for the general public. And this is how we uh, be, managed to become uh, a little bit more popular and to draw attention and interest and supporters, of course. <laughs> so this is one thing that w we didn't envisage uh, when we um, planned the project. Uh, as for the website, uh, it's also um, actually, uh, a, I can say it's a platform where we put all uh, the materials we create under the project in order, again, to be uh, able to help uh, all the stakeholders. Um, each presentation or article or anything that we um, create or find uh, is shared there. All the um, findings uh, of the um, uh, direct conservation activities, uh, the maps, the GIS data, everything is being published on, the, uh, on this uh, website uh, because one thing I have to say, although it might not sound very uh, modest, it's the first place, uh, virtual place, uh, where you can find so much information at one, at one place uh, and in such a good structure and uh, even in, in for the uh, species that we are focusing on, it's even, uh, we can say it's exhaustive in information in country. Um, we brought these um, <laughs> uh, posters just uh, for you to see them, how they look. They are also of course, um, placed on the website. And this is one material that we are sharing uh, with all the stakeholders. Uh, these are the main um, species that we focus on. However, in order to, um, how shall I say, to uh, avoid conflicts with the general public and especially with the uh, beekeepers, we, we kept one of them. Just to, to uh, mention this, because uh, this issue was raised by many of the previous presenters, that we have to try and avoid uh, direct conflict with the stakeholders in order to be able to uh, create better partnership and co co cooperation with them. Uh, with, okay. Uh, just one example, which is again an exception of uh, the activities uh, which, which were planned originally. Uh, in order to uh, raise the public awareness, we organized demonstrations of, the, um, of selective methods of uh, eradication of the species that we are focusing on in the very centers of the big towns, which was not absolutely not planned uh, to be done under this project because the project is, as you understood, uh, focusing on um, uh, habitats, wild habitats. Uh, however, we decided to do these demonstrations in the, in the cities in order to uh, create more uh, awareness and to attract the attention of the people because uh, those were absolutely unknown. And we, we think that the result was good and that uh, 
This way we gain support for the wild habitats. Yeah, I, I can end. So if you can, if you have any questions, we will be happy to, to answer. Thank you. That's an interesting perspective from Eastern Europe, where we we don't know much about that region, I think. And also the range of stakeholders you are working with is, is really incredible. Uh, farmers, beekeepers, and, and foresters. Um, if there is any questions, please find uh, Svetlana and her colleague uh, during the network drink. Because we have one more talk left on our program, um, which is about the Life in Vazakwa project, uh, a project Mediterranean in Spain and Portugal. Thank you very much. I know we are a bit on the limit and that we are the last uh, step before the coffee, so I will try to, to make it uh, very brief. Um, first of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity of presenting our project, Life in Basakwa. As we are also uh, in the beginning, we, are, we have just finished our preliminary actions, and this is for us a great opportunity not only to present, but also to learn and to listen to other, to other projects, to other experiences. So, my name is Rosa Olivo. I come from the University of Murcia, and I will present the Life in Basakwa project, which, which stands for Aquatic Invasive Alien Species of Freshwater and Destroying Systems, Awareness and Prevention in the Iberian Peninsula. So, this is moving without me touching anything. Okay, so, uh, our project falls in, in the, um, yes, that's, into the uh, program of environment, and inf uh, environment information and governance, which promotes um, projects uh, of information information awareness raising and knowledge transfer. Uh, we are implementing uh, in Basakwa in the whole of the Iberian Peninsula, in Spain and Portugal. Uh, we just finished our first uh, year and we still have four years more to go. Um, our budget is of uh, slightly more than three million euros and our consortium uh, is led by the University of Murcia and there we have uh, three universities more, uh, Santiago de Compostela, Évora, and uh, Navarra. We have uh, three NGOs, the Iberian Society of Ichthyology, the International Union for the Conservation of uh, Nature, and also the uh, Portuguese Association for Environmental Education. We have the National Museum of Natural Sciences, which is also the Spanish National Research Council, and finally, we have the FA agency, which is the National Spanish Communication Agency. Uh, and as a co-financer, we have the uh, Spanish Ministry of uh, Environment. So, our main objective is to reduce the introduction and spread of aquatic IAS. And when we say aquatic, we mean freshwater and estuarine systems. We are uh, basing on two different approaches, uh, both on prevention and early detection. And our three main action points are basically increase uh, synergies between uh, experts, between knowledge building and management stakeholders, which we understand are basically decision makers, technicians in NGOs and consultancies, and scientists. As a second action point, uh, we want to uh, train uh, key sectors or key target groups. And finally, we want to uh, increase awareness in the general public. So basically, our, the sectors we are addressing to are, uh, we are, addressing to are uh, experts and also those uh, target groups which we understand are more vulner vulnerable to unintended introduction introductions, that is, uh, public administrations, uh, universities, surveillance agents, environmental educations, anglers, kayakers, etc. One of the main uh, difficulties we came across and has been discussed this morning is, of course, we need to find the appropriate message to communicate. Of course, different, different uh, stakeholders react to different messages 
according to their knowledge and to their uh, interest. And uh, what we call the social acceptability to management strategies, which has uh, been discussed uh, earlier in today, uh, which is um, how to deal with that uh, public opinion and without um, different uh, perceptions and feelings. It is really important, we understand, to anticipate to those, to those uh, potential conflicts. So, obviously, uh, we need to involve as many people as possible. To, we need to reach and uh, convince them. So, for that, um, we need to involve uh, in our project different entities, different uh, stakeholders. And in that sense, uh, in Basakwa has uh, uh, an, an, an added value, uh, which is that our uh, partners are uh, distributed in a way that we already reach most part of the territory, but also we have a 20 pre-agreements signed with different entities, with different um, NGOs, uh, projects, uh, uh, museums, aquariums, uh, uh, scientific associations that will help us implement uh, certain actions. So I will very, very briefly go through uh, some of our main actions. I will start with the governance and development of early warning and rapid response tools. Um, we are uh, updating, the project is updating the Iberian Black and Alarm List of Aquatic EAS and working on the pathways and risk review. For that, uh, we are making a transnational horizon scanning exercise where 56 experts uh, coming from uh, the different uh, uh, main groups, vertebrates, invertebrates, and, uh, and aquatic plants, are uh, already working. Uh, not only from the project staff, but uh, we have also involved uh, experts from uh, outside. Um, the work, uh, the, the prioritization is being done uh, from an initial list of 174 established aquatic EAS and for a list of 256 potential aquatic EAS. Uh, of course, the main output of this um, uh, action will be um, uh, creating technical material addressed uh, mainly to experts that we hope will be used in their management. Um, we are also working on the um, impact uh, assessment. We are applying uh, a new protocol, uh, the ACAT, a, a methodology developed by the EUCN, which consists of a, or which tries to classify uh, invasive species according to the, Im to the environmental impact they, they cause. We have already um, um, celebrated a first wor workshop which again involved not only uh, uh, experts from the from the staff, and uh, around the and uh, in the following years we expect to to organize at least two workshops more. Um, we are also working on creating a, an Iberian database, as in many places the information is is scattered around uh, different sources. Uh, and we are trying to collate all that information uh, and put it together in one only database that hopefully we will feed the and will be a vector to the European database EASIN. Uh, this Iberian database will be part of an Iberian uh, web platform that will not only have this scientific information but uh, will also have uh, news, uh, courses, materials, etc and uh, will be uh, hopefully a, um, a, a complementary source to the, to the existing uh, EASIM platform. Obviously, it will include information addressed mainly to Iberian experts. And the last of uh, our governance activities um, is addressed to uh, working on a strategy for the management of Iberian aquatic EAS. Um, we already have a number of strategies. We have, for example, the uh, American mink, the zebra mussel, but uh, in Basakwa intends to fill in uh, some, at least some of those filling gaps. 
um, we, as a preliminary idea and as a preliminary in preliminary conversations with the uh, um, with the uh, authorities in both countries, we intend to work on the fresh uh, water uh, fish. This, method this uh, methodology uh, will be uh, participatory. Again, uh, we, will, we need to involve uh, the key sectors and uh, mainly uh, strategic uh, uh, target groups, such as, for example, uh, uh, authorities and, for example, um, anglers. One of the main constraints we have in the project is that, is that we don't have authorities in our consortium, so of course we will need to do a special effort there. Uh, moving forward to the communication information and training campaigns we have addressed for the specific uh, key stakeholders. Uh, we have a number of uh, MOOC and relearning courses, workshops, seminars, um, EA sessions in networkings and uh, international congresses, not only on, on the international congresses uh, organized by the proper uh, consortium, like the UCN, for example, but we have also established a number of uh, free agreements to, to develop um, uh, these activities in, in other uh, congresses. We, as said before, uh, will uh, be organizing uh, at least two more uh, workshops on the uh, ACAT applicability. We have a number of events addressed to different stakeholders. Uh, we have a big campaign addressed to the educational sector, not only to universities, but also to high, uh, to high education. And there, of course, we have uh, four universities involved in the, um, in the consortium. We also have uh, news, radio slots, interviews. Uh, we will create materials, of course, uh, codes of conduct, uh, as Elena was mentioning. Uh, we have uh, videos, handbooks, triptychs, and uh, we have already developed a questionnaire, which is online, available for any one of you who wants to, to answer it, uh, not only as a social, not only as an awareness tool, but also, of course, to uh, collect information uh, to be able to assess the impact that our uh, project will do in the social perception. Uh, we have more than 105,000 questionnaires done already. And regarding the general communication campaign, uh, it is led uh, by the Spanish National um, Communication Agency, which is, of course, an added uh, a safe value as they are experts in not only creating news, but also amplifying that uh, impact. Just as an example, our Twitter account in, in only one year has already more than 2,700 followers. Uh, but apart from that campaign, we have communication campaign, we have also some uh, events, uh, such as, for example, uh, a train and airport campaign, just as a just as the ASAP um, uh, project. And we also intend to, um, well, in fact, we have it designed already, an itinerant exhibition that will be moving all around the Iberian Peninsula in both countries, Spain and Portugal. As a transversal action. Um, uh, we also have a citizen science program. Uh, initially, when we wrote the proposal, we, we um, uh, decided to, do, uh, to design a new app, but now we have come up with a much better solution than that, which is um, creating a kind of uh, Iberian module inside the existing uh, Invasive Island Species Europe app, which is developed by the JRC. So we are currently uh, working on making uh, new fact sheets and uh, hopefully by next spring, the Iberian users in Spain and Portugal will have uh, more than 80 uh, species or fact sheets uh, available in the citizen science program. As well, we have a campaign uh, addressed uh, specifically to disseminate this citizen science program, which includes, apart from other events, uh, mass events such as bioblitzes. So just to finish off, our main challenges and constraints, the ones I would like to highlight very, very quickly, uh, of course, we have a really ambitious scope in the in Basakwa project. We have a large and transnational consortium. We have a large implement, implementation area, and we have a, a, a very wide 
uh, and the diverse number of stakeholders we are addressing. Uh, we need to achieve a communication and involvement of the different target groups, and for that, we need to uh, make a special effort with those that we understand uh, are more crucial, for example, authorities, for example, anglers. anglers. Uh, for that, we, need, we will uh, create specific activities, specific uh, workshop, workshops, specific materials, and of course, we have specific pre-agreements addressed uh, only to involve those kind of uh, um, stakeholders. We are, uh, one of the difficulties is, of course, the social involvement, uh, which depends on a certain level of uncertainty. Most of our activities depend on the willingness and on the voluntariness of um, stakeholders. Uh, we will see if they attend their act our activities. We will see if they get involved and they and they follow our our suggestions. Um, and of course, achieving a replicability and transferability. Um, in that uh, sense, we have uh, those sessions and networking events in Congress that I was just mentioning. Uh, we have free and accessible materials and tools, uh, for sure in Spanish and Portuguese. We will try to do most of them in English as well. And uh, many of our actions include protocols and reports uh, collecting those uh, lessons learned. Uh, we are sure that we that by working on on those uh, um, I am I am finishing this is the last one we are sure that by uh, working on those uh, uh, rapid response uh, tools and governance activities we will be able to improve the efficiency of the management of ES. Uh, we are convinced that uh, by increasing awareness and also training those key target groups, uh, we will reduce the problem of uh, alien species. And of course, we understand that it is difficult uh, to achieve a change in, in only three, four years, but um, we do hope that in Basakwa is that turning point to change the um, social perception on, on this problematic in the Iberian Peninsula. Initially, we expected to reach more than uh, 25,000 people. Today, we're even more optimistic. And uh, we have uh, already organized in our first year uh, more than 80 communication activities and reached only with these uh, events uh, more than uh, 6,000 people. So any questions that you might have? Please ask, perhaps not now, but please uh, email us and uh, I, we will try to answer them or put you in contact with the responsible people. Thank you. I think it's interesting to see how you're going to apply the, the globally adopted ICAT system of IOCN to a range of uh, IAS and also that you are using the European app that uh, JRC have developed instead of making your own. It's, I think a very sensible uh, way to go. We have to uh, move on, but before giving the word to the European <laughs> Commission themselves uh, for a final word uh, after this uh, exhausting day, uh, we have uh, one announcement, which is that a very nice colleague from Germany is trying to get out of the country uh, tomorrow. And she has trouble uh, achieving that goal uh, due to the train star strikes. And it doesn't really matter how she is getting out. Uh, she is prepared to do many things to make that happen. So <laughs> if tomorrow you are getting out of Belgium and uh, planning to pass by a train station or other means of transport that could be useful to her, please get in touch with Katrin Schneider. She is here in front of me. Uh, she's very good company for a few hours uh, <laughs> at least. Okay, it's my pleasure now to uh, close this day um, and I'll give the word to Miriam Dumortier, uh, who's actually a former colleague of us uh, at INBO, who uh, is now working at European Commission um, on the IAS regulation. She will give us a closing word. Thank you, Tim. Good evening, everyone. I think it was a very inspiring 
uh, very encouraging, very interesting day. So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for this uh, excellent initiative. Thanks also to all these uh, interesting speakers and this uh, enthusiastic audience. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you, of course, to get the opportunity to give the, the last word. So here we are. Um, the globe is currently facing two major crises, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. You all know very well. We had our first global assessment of the state of biodiversity and ecosystem services some months ago, the IPBES report. And the picture shown, shown there was uh, not an optimistic one. We are, uh, they estimated we are even losing one million uh, species uh, globally, of course. Uh, the rate of extinction is 10 to hundreds of times the background rate of extinction. So we really have a biodiversity crisis. And uh, some weeks ago, we also had a new report uh, the, at the European level, the State of the European Environment Report, uh, assessing the state of all elements of uh, the environment. And there was one which was clearly read where we did not achieve our targets, and this was, again, biodiversity. So we all know one of the major causes of this biodiversity loss, there are five, and one of them is invasive alien species. So in 2010, at the global and at the European level, a biodiversity strategy was developed, a biodiversity strategy from 2011-2020. Um, this strategy included a target on invasive alien species, both strategies, and it was more or less the same target. The approach was at two, uh, two approaches, one towards species prioritization, Prioritizing, it's too late. <laughs> prioritizing species and addressing them, and prioritizing pathways and addressing them. So two approaches. Um, so today, prioritizing species, we have seen. You all know we have prioritized 66 species at the European level. Today, we have seen a lot of practices that have shown how together we try to address those species. So I think we are really progressing well there. Then we also have the, the other side of the target, the pathway management. Uh, we are currently looking into the first reporting of the member states on the implementation of our regulation. And what we see there is that the approach is very scattered. It's also what we saw today. We saw four member states. We saw Belgium with three priority uh, pathways. UK with six priority pathways, but there were other ones. And then France and Netherlands are still working on their uh, action plans. So the picture for pathways is uh, rather scattered. So I have some invitations on the screen for you. And the first one is that currently we are evaluating the biodiversity strategy, the EU biodiversity strategy. And uh, very soon there will be an online public consultation. It should be within the next few weeks. We don't, do not know exactly uh, when. But uh, on this slide, I gave you the general uh, website on, on consultations. So the consultation on the evaluation of the, bi of the bi bi biodiversity strategy will also be there. So this is an uh, invitation. Please uh, participate. Give your opinion. Tell us what worked, what did not work especially your old specialist on invasive alien species, he evaluate what we have done on invasive alien species. So use this website and also promote it to other colleagues uh, that might do it. Um, meanwhile, time is going on and we have a new commission. We have a new uh, president and new commissioners. And uh, the first thing our new president said was, Biodiversity and the climate crisis will be my top priority. We were really, really happy to hear this. And she said that within the next 10, uh, within the first 100 days in service, I will propose a, a European Green Deal. And this has been proposed uh, last week. Last week, we got a Green Deal. And of course, it includes some information on biodiversity. So she, there is an announcement of 
Biodiversity Strategy to 2030, which should be ready by March 2020. That means that we will have to work very hard. It should be ready so quickly because we want to go to the, the negotiations on the global biodiversity strategy in Kunming in uh, October with a, a big uh, European ambition. And so this is to help this. And then after this, uh, the global biodiversity strategy in 2020, we will, 21, we will have additional actions on biodiversity in Europe uh, to really keep on top uh, of the biodiversity uh, policy. There was one extra sentence which I also mentioned this morning, and it is, this is this sentence that all other policies should contribute to the biodiversity target. You really need to remember this. This is a very important one, very important also for invasive alien species. It, when we want to make real progress on pathways, well, we have an excellent uh, tool there. So for the moment, the EU IAS team, which is Spiros and myself, we are thinking about what should go into the biodiversity strategy to 2030 on invasive alien species. So here is my second invitation. If you have any suggestions where, so these are our first ideas, uh, we need to gear up on the pathways. If you have some concrete suggestions there, or maybe you don't agree, that is also very welcome. Uh, let us know, let us know what would be the priority to work on pathways at the EU European level, uh, which other policies should be involved as a priority. Uh, let us know all your ideas and you can just send them to our uh, functional mailbox. Then I want to announce uh, two projects, and uh, two projects that are related to issues which we also discussed this morning. And the first one is on the management of uh, invert in of vertebrate invasive alien species. This morning we already discussed the sensitivity, the public emotions on this. So we want to have a project on this and we want to do this project in a very participatory way. So this project is intended to develop a manual on the management of invasive alien vertebrate species. But we do not just want a manual that is put in the cupboard uh, in between many other books. No, we want something that lives and that is used in the field. And therefore, after having this manual, we will have eight workshops all across Europe. And in these workshops, this manual will be further adjusted to the local conditions. It will be changed because we know the sensitivities in, across Europe are not always the same. It will also be illustrated with local examples. And finally, it will be also translated in the local languages. And uh, finally, this project will also disseminate this material and further use it. And the idea is that this manual is the, is the own is owned by all people in Europe working on invasive alien uh, vertebrate uh, animals, and that this uh, manual just keeps alive and is changed, and it is yours. Do whatever whatever you like to do with it. With it. And so here is our third invitation. So all the uh, the persons who are dealing with invasive alien uh, vertebrates, if you are interested to participate in this project please just send us your, uh, your, email, your name and email and we will pass this on to the contractor. So we are looking to people with experience, uh, scientists or practitioners or whoever who has experience, who would like to share it, who would like to contribute in the discussions. Uh, we also are also looking for places to host these workshops across uh, Europe. So let us know if you are interested. Then there is a second pathway, uh, second uh, project, and this is on pathways. We will select uh, five priority pathways, and we already selected three. This is the aquatic ornamental species, plants as well as animals. That's the first one. The second one is pets. And the third one is soil transport, intentional and unintentional uh, soil transport. And we still need to select two other pathways. And for every pathway, we will organize a platform. And in each of these platforms, we will involve many different stakeholders, people involved in the introduction that are benefiting from the introduction of the species, 
people involved in the management or who are facing damage. So we want to see all the sides of the problem. We will bring all those people together in the platforms. The platforms will meet at least four times. There will also be field visits. Uh, these platforms, they will visit businesses that are involved in the introduction of these species. They will, these platforms will also visit places that control the same species so that all these people learn to know each other better and in, improve the understanding because we think this is very essential to make progress uh, on invasive alien species. So that is my fourth invitation. Whoever is interested to join one of these platforms to discuss certain uh, pathways of invasive alien species, also please uh, let us know. And so I come to the end of these uh, ending words. Uh, today we have seen we have a very big challenge. Invasive alien species is a very big challenge and we have minimal resources. That was a clear message from this meeting. But we also have seen that thanks to the regulation, you're getting organized. The structures are getting into place and, and co cooperation is, is starting up. But I think this is the way we need to continue. We need to further follow this path of cooperation because while doing this, we will increase our impact. It's not only cooperation among organizations or among countries, it's also cooperation with citizens and with stakeholders, and mainly also this element of cooperating involving other uh, policies. Yeah, and I'm thinking of trade policies, uh, transport policies, for the prevention uh, on uh, agriculture policies that can be involved in the control. So we have, uh, this, is, this is an important uh, priority to, to establish and to work together and to make these other policies also address uh, invasive alien species because now they all need to address uh, biodiversity as well. And it's not only about the policies themselves, but it's also about the financial instruments. This afternoon, we saw a series of live projects. Projects. This, this is the financial instrument for the environmental policy, but we have other EU financial instruments. We already heard some examples of, uh, of Interreg projects. See, that is the cohesion funding. There are also resources there to be used for invasive alien species. So please use them. Then another one is, I mentioned already, agriculture. The common agriculture policy, there are also a lot of resource, resources there. Eh? Public, uh, there's public money for public goods, they always say. So, but this is also for the management of invasive alien species. So through the CAP, we could involve farmers to help us in managing invasive alien species. So we have to explore these uh, instruments and use them. It's organized differently in all member states, so you have to look to your member state how to, how to use them. And the last one I want to mention is the research funding. We did not have any research projects on invasive alien species since a while, but we know that within Horizon Europe, there will again be an opening on invasive alien species. So be ready to prepare proposal and also request research funding because we need a lot of extra research also in invasive alien species. And I think that's uh, all. Uh, I, today I felt a lot of enthusiasm, so I would finish by saying keep up this uh, good spirit because working all together we can really make a difference. I think we have seen this today. Thank you. Me again. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Me again for a last few words. I will ask a few people from the audience to join me, all the ones in, uh, involved in the management and the preparation of this uh, event. So first, you two. <laughs> so Alexia and Rebecca. Uh, I would like also to involve Etienne, Tim and Olivier. So the Walloon region, INBO, and uh, the Belgian Science Policy Office, we, they all contributed financially to, to this event. Um, Brussels Environment for the very, very nice venue that we, that we have uh, enjoyed it during the whole day. Uh, Max, my colleague Max, where is he? There, you have to come. <laughs> and also DJ, <laughs> two platform colleagues for helping me with the practicalities of this, uh, of today. The 
technical responsible behind. Thanks a lot for you and the translators. Thanks a lot for all the effort, for the video recorders, for the pictures. Thanks a lot. Um, am I forgetting someone? Yes, all the Inbo colleagues for the microphone. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, Ebe, you did a great job. Thanks a lot. Um, also, just two little things. Can you please don't forget to bring those because uh, it's re really valuable. We need to get them back. And also the badges, you can let them on the table outside. No. <laughs> and uh, so it's our old pleasure to welcome you to our final drink. Uh, I hope you will have an uh, opportunity to further discuss. And thanks a lot for joining, for staying. <laughs> and bye-bye. Uh, <laughs>